trying to gain some size, I would check out Stan Efferding's vertical diet. I am working on doing more zone two training. Do I need to have a heart rate monitor to accurately measure that? I think the watch can be so far off that I don't even think it's good to utilize it. However, I would use your breathing. What did you suggest for anyone over 65 to add in some weight training? Get an app. My right shoulder mobility keeps me from low bar squatting. Just like all your other problems, just sweep them right underneath the rug. <laughs> now, myofascial release is like almost always my first place for people to start. I have atrophy in a leg from a surgery years ago. How many more sets less reps should I do with the smaller leg? Instead of just trying to increase the amount of sets you're doing, just try to make sure the set quality is intense enough. There we go. And we're live. Oh, my God. Yeah. You were saying, Mark, I'm sorry. Yeah. What uh, What's like the easiest body part to like bro out with, with somebody else, like just to train where you think they, like if you were to say, a, you know, a certain body part, they might be like, nah. But like what's one where you can just convince mm -hmm. just about anybody to go do it with you for a little bit? Yeah. I think it's pretty safe to say biceps, right? Because mm -hmm. When you're a kid and everyone's like, oh, you know, he's big and strong or whatever, like everybody goes to like a flex their bicep, I feel like. And I think everybody wants bigger arms. There's, I've not met one person that's like, nah, bro, bigger arms is just not cool. Yeah. So like if you're like walking through the office and you're like, hey, let's go hit a couple sets of biceps and triceps. 100% of the people will say yes. Yeah. Everybody'd be like, okay. <laughs> Probably won't really ask another question after that. No, no not at all. I think back works pretty good too because it's like, it's just not, it's not a crazy commitment. But then if some see that you can get tricked though, because then if someone invites you to train some back and they're like, all right, let's start off with some bent over rows. You're like, what the hell? <laughs> I was not expecting this to be like a real workout. I didn't know we were training herniated discs. Yeah. I didn't know we were like That's trying different. to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> you know, you're training herniated discs. <laughs> That's what I think of when I think of bent over rows. Like, hey, what do you think about we start off with bent over rows? You're like, uh, you know, oh, uh, actually I, I look at that. I don't have the time that I thought I did. You know, today's lat pull down day not bent over road day it, maybe next week or you know down down the road i think back you're always thinking like we get to like cheat with machines yeah you yeah know? guys join Good in stuff. let us know what the easiest thing to bro out is uh what, what you dig what you dig i love back though back never just like back makes me just internally nut it's just that <laughs> it's just like the first thing i want to go into the gym and mm -hmm. do is just row and get a black pump <sighs> it always feels yes. good and it feels good like um the seated row or getting on a machine um lat pull down lat pull down always feels amazing i started out good. probably nearly every workout i've ever done has probably started out with a lat pull down i just <laughs> gravitate towards it because i'm like that's going to be a great that's my form of stretching right there my favorite machine in my early 20s was like the hammer strength isolateral row it's mm. like that was that was if if there's any machine that i would like honestly kind of go to the grave with even though i love so many things the hammer strength the ice lateral row has just like so much nostalgia with me and it. Mm -hmm. I'd hit that thing every day at the gym. It didn't matter if it was back there or not. I'd fucking hit the hammer strength the mm -hmm. lateral row. Yeah, when I, you know, was barely new to the gym and stuff, the the one movement that I felt like I was actually accomplishing, you know, doing the right way was a low cable uh, pulley row. Like, mm. and then you know, fast forward, Doug Brig Brignoli's like, no, don't do that. That's not that's garbage. And I'm like, but I feel pretty damn good when I do it. So I still it. I still do it every now and again, but. Yeah, that back day is, is amazing. That was like when you can start learning how to flex your lats, you mm. feel like a freaking bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. got 62 people in here already. Heck oh yeah. God. You guys bro. are fucking great. Thank By the you. way, we will answer your questions, guys. Hammer strength, isolata row, row. Is that the one that's like in the gym? Yeah, we have one in the gym. We have one in the gym. But uh, there's th at all there's the 24s I went to. Yeah, yeah. But that's like the one. Mm -hmm. That's st that's still the one. Yeah, that's by Prime. and It is fantastic. What are some of your thoughts in SEMA about you know, like sometimes you might do a movement for bodybuilding purposes where you do it for hypertrophy. Mm. But I know nowadays you're doing a lot of stuff where the range of motion is different because I remember you showing some rows before. And um, I think you shared something that I learned from uh, like Charles Glass where, you know, the elbows aren't really, they don't really need to necessarily go back behind the body on a row mm -hmm. to like build the lats. But um, do you have different thoughts on that now or you just train things slightly differently now? <sighs> no, I do. I, I 
Don't, I don't. Um, it, it, I just still train through a long range of motion, but the goal is still to feel that area working. So when, even though I do a row with like a super long range and let myself reach, when I come in, I'm still looking for a deep, hard contraction. I'm still holding that contraction. I still over time want some growth, but I'm not only looking for growth now. I'm looking for growth and movement ability, right? Whereas before when I was younger, it was just like, I just want to get fucking big, but now I want to be big and still have extreme amount of flexibility because of the sport I do. Yeah. When you do something like a row, you, you say you, you still might only have the elbows go to like the midline of your body, maybe not pull it back further, or do you want to pull it back further to get some twisting in there if you were doing it like one arm? I might do some reps where like, uh, I will maybe twist a little bit, but the main goal is to feel that in my lat, feel that in my deep lat, feel a hard, deep contraction, hold that contraction and then come back. Mm. So I'll do a, like when I do sets, I'll do some, um, some repetitions in a slightly different way than maybe some of the other repetitions. Uh, but the goal is still the same. The goal is still deep stimulus, a really good pump in that specific mm. area and getting that area to move through its full range of motion. That's, that's the goal. I always think it's kind of more of an art than a science, but you mm. can mix a little bit of both. You know, it's good to learn. It's good to learn from uh, all different kinds of people, and it's good to apply different things. I do the same thing. I do different styles of reps. Um, sometimes I might do three sets in a row that are very similar, and on the fourth set, I might do one different yeah. just because I feel like it and just because it feels good. Mm -hmm. Yo, real quick, I want to – 82 people in here. I want to give you guys a heads up. Um, we have three Super Chats so far. We're going to be answering your questions. At the end of this, we're going to be giving away some goodies from – hunker and stool we're going to be giving away some vivo barefoot shoes we're going to be giving away some gift cards from within you a bunch of goodies that you guys are going to like but you gotta we have to have answered your question and at the end if you win please be part of the you have to be part of the discord and you have to message me so the discord link is in the description if you're a winner get in the discord send me your email address and your address so if we give away anything along with the year supply of hostage tape if we give away anything you're going to get your stuff all right power project family if you guys want to get in on our next live q a join the discord down below because this is pre-recorded and we answered a bunch of your fitness and nutrition questions we also gave away some goodies from our sponsors so if you want to get on the next one join the discord below and enjoy the show all right awesome <laughs> so I guess i'll start with some super chats because mm -hmm. There's a few in here already. I think we have fucking, we have three super chats and gunpowder tea, please. He's always, this guy won shit in the last two Q and A's. <laughs> okay, so advice for skinny body type to gain a five. To gain what? Size. <laughs> I was like, what? Hold oh. on. <laughs> to gain Am size. Am I having a heart attack or something? Because I don't see five anywhere. I said five. Five. To gain five. Got it. Gaining you some. You want to get a little bit of five? Bigger thighs. Got it. Getting big. I think uh, gunpowder has taken off thursdays off of work <laughs> probably <laughs> just to tune in can we talk about thighs though mm. i like big thighs mm -hmm. gain size on your thighs i like big thighs chicken thighs chicken thighs mm -hmm. yeah but yeah so yeah guys tips for gaining size from a skinny like guy. jay cutler and ronnie coleman and those guys exactly you like those thighs that's the that's the type of thigh mm -hmm. i'm talking about <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that leg stomp from jay cutler was something else wasn't it yeah <laughs> uh shit trying to gain some size i think you know, we need to eat properly, right? We're going to need to like, it's not talked about enough, I don't think, is you probably need a little bit of a caloric surplus if you're trying to get big. It's going to be more difficult to gain size. Even if you're on maintenance calories, I think it's going to be a little bit, it might be tough if you've been already training for a little while and you're not uh, adding calories, I think it's going to make it more difficult. So I would check out Stan Efferding's Vertical Diet. I think it's one of the better diets out there in terms of like it encouraging people to like, you know, actually eat their food um, rather than like a lot. Of, there's a lot of diets out there where people are just eating less. There's like intermittent fasting. There's all kinds of stuff where people are trying to like lose body fat. But to get bigger, um, I would look at Stan Efferding's vertical diet or I'd look into like a bodybuilding style diet, like a bulking thing. And when you do bulk, you don't need like a crazy excess of calories, but you do need some uh, more. So that would be one thing to concentrate on. And then I would strength train, you know, I would say maybe get yourself involved in uh, five by five or three sets of five or something like that on particular movements, maybe some version of a bench, some version of a squat, some version of a deadlift, 
because I have found that you want to pick movements that you're going to be excited about. So you don't have to pick the movements I just mentioned, but I think it's important that you develop this idea of trying to get better at particular exercises and trying to get stronger in those exercises. And you're comparing those exercises one week to the next week and so on with similar form and technique. And so hopefully over time, your body will have an adaptation to that. And as a result, you'll need to use more weight. And maybe you'll be able to do like a little bit more reps or more sets and those kinds of things. So to me, uh, that's a great way to get big. And then you would still fill in the rest of your workout with uh, volume and just you know, uh, trying to hit those, uh, body parts the way that you normally would. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about how to drop body fat, decreasing meal frequency, et cetera. But for a lot of skinny guys, one of their issues is eating enough food. They might not realize it, but they're not eating enough. So you want to maybe purposefully increase your frequency of eating because if you have like, you know, two or three meals in a day and you're trying to grow, sometimes you're not getting enough food in those meals. Like I can put away a lot of food in two meals. If I wanted to, I could have 2000 calorie meals. I've done that before, but that's because I can put food away. And if you're a person who has a problem putting away a lot of food in big in, in, in a meal, then you might want to have like multiple meals through the day and increase your eating frequency. Because if you increase your eating frequency, um, you'll find that you start to get a little bit hungrier more often, mm. right? So that's something that can be helpful. I know our boy, Kenny, I think he we answered a question similar to this, and he said he used to blend food, mm -hmm. like he blended chicken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to go that far, you can, um, but that, that that's your prerogative. Um, obviously, too, get on your recovery. If you're not getting enough sleep at night, um, your performance is going to be trash. We talk about sleep all the time, so that's super important. Uh, and I think it's you, you, you've mentioned, you know, you're only as good as your recovery. So mm. like, you got to take that shit seriously. Any person who's trying to grow or any person that's an athlete has to take their recovery seriously because if you're not recovering well, if you're not taking advantage of that, then you're leaving a lot of gains on the gate table as far as growth is concerned. Mm -hmm. And then something that I, I've heard, I think uh, the online coach recently had even mentioned it, like, you know, you, you got to be prepared to get a little chubby. Mm. Uh, but in, in my case, so I'm, you know, about six feet tall, we'll say, depending on what shoes I'm wearing. Um, I was 165 pounds and still had a big belly. Like I still was like, I had a, a pot belly, right? I was chubby. And so when I'd hear people talking about like, oh, the, you know, skinny guys, as soon as they, as they start to put on, you know, a little bit of weight, they see the fat go up and they get scared and they want to go back down. And I'm like, well, shit, man, I'm already there and I haven't even started. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a little tricky, but what's going to happen is like, I, what happened for me is I went kind of for like the body recomp, you know? So like my weight almost stayed the same, but like the muscle development started coming. Yeah. And then another huge thing, well, two more huge things for me was um, the the fuel that I was putting in my body. You know, it's like, oh, no, I'm eating calories. Like, I, I just want to get big or whatever it may be. But then, you know, once I started hanging out with hanging out with Mark, he would even tell me to not have protein shakes just for the simple fact of this would hurt my stomach because he knew how jacked up my stomach could get when I eat too much. It's going to take us too long for you to digest that protein and you need to be able to eat frequently. Yes. So what, what instead of, so, I mean, protein shakes are good, but what happened was I was kind of clearing out the room in my stomach for stuff like ground beef and rice, right? For more things that are going to help me fuel my goals and then the other thing too, which is like, uh, this is a whole nother podcast episode was just like, what, what in your mind equals big, right? So like when I used to think about this back in the day is when I was flooded with like videos of CT Fletcher, Hodge twins, looking at these dudes that were really freaking big. And here's my skinny ass being like, yeah, I want to get big. But if I looked at who I am right now, back then I'd be like, that's big. Like that's sick. I want to be that. And I'm only 180 pounds. Right. So like getting into the, the, like setting a goal, uh, I don't want to say like an obtainable goal, but understanding what big for you means, cause it's going to be different for everybody. So keeping that in mind, I think is very important. Some people four inches is fine. That's big. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that, that, that can be big. <laughs> yeah. Right. If you know how to use but it. But it's really about being four and a half inches. That's huge. Massive. They, they can do that with a link Thick. in our description. <laughs> Andrew, I think you brought up a really good point with the uh, protein shake and people do this with snacks as well. And this is why you got to kind of leave the snacks for like the little kids maybe and, uh -huh. and grow up and start to uh, eat differently. You know, if you're trying to be an athlete, trying to be stronger, trying to recomp all these things, 
Um, you're going to have to eat slightly differently. It doesn't mean you can't make room for snacks here and there. It doesn't mean you can't make room for treats here and there. But the best way to make the food that's in your refrigerator look unattractive is to have highly processed foods. Uh, then when you have highly processed foods, any, anytime you open your fridge, you're going to be like, oh, we don't have anything. Here. You're going to close it. And then you're going to end up in your pantry. And you're going to reach for chips or granola bars or candy bars or whatever other bullshit you have. You're either going to be looking in the pantry or in your freezer for ice cream and things like that. And that's the biggest mistake that I see people make uh, broadly is uh, they'll say, oh, I can't hit my protein. You know, I, I can't, oh, man, I can't do 120 grams of protein a day or I can't do 200 grams of protein a day. It's way too hard. But as soon as they start to subtract out some of the other stuff that they eat, uh, then they're going to be hungrier for those proteins. So all good stuff to keep in mind to get mm. big. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, one other thing. We are going to get the – we're going to answer the Super Chats first. And everyone who's sending in Super Chats, fucking thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And we love everybody in here anyway. But we're going to answer the Super Chats first once we finish answering all the Super Chats. One guy gave us, what, a 1000 bucks at one time? That's yeah. crazy. I think so. Yeah. yeah that, thank you. That's wild. Yeah. But once we answer all the Super Chats, then we're going to get to the rest of the questions. And then if another Super Chat comes in, we're going to get to that first. So the next Super Chat, Leviathan Lifts. Mm. What is your guys' favorite moments, favorite lifting moments from 2023? That's interesting. Best lifting mm. moment of 2023? Mm. I don't fucking know right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, the only thing that comes to mind right away, if, and it's not a, a good lifting moment, like that Larry Wheels situation where the guy tore his pec. Oh, gosh. You know, so yeah. I'm just thinking like tragedy. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> that my mind's in the wrong spot, but, oh, um, Shit. you know, I think maybe the year previous, there was some pretty cool lifting going on between like Hap Thor and, and like Hap Thor, I think, you know, deadlifted 1100, um, there have been really cool uh, deadlifts uh, over the last maybe year, or year and a half that people have ripped up. People are, you know, breaking records all the time. But Especially young ass people. Yeah. yeah. Young people are getting re freakishly strong. And they're coming out of nowhere. You're like, well, mm -hmm. I've never heard of this guy's name before. I should keep track of who the hell this guy mm -hmm. is because it's mm -hmm. been pretty amazing. Shout out to uh, Jeremy Avila for uh, doing a 903 deadlift recently in training. Sheesh. He's an absolute beast. But um I don't know. Nothing really stands out to me. Uh, I guess like one of the cooler things out of this past year was the rise of Sam Sulek, I think is a really cool story and good for yeah. him. Like I think the he's attracting people to bodybuilding um, in a way that we probably haven't seen in a long time. Like the last person that blew up like that in that way that I could think of would be like Dana Lynn Bailey who would need to be like ushered by police officers when she would go around at like the Arnold classic and stuff like that. Wow. Pretty wild. Cause she just had people like in a frenzy for her, but uh, that's a really cool thing. Cool event that happened with uh, Sam Sulek over the last couple months. Mm -hmm. There's Jeremy uh, ripping up a 903 pound uh, deadlift recently. Dude. Yeah. As far as lifting ones, honestly, I got, no I got nothing. I got nothing. Um, if we're talking about personal best lifting moments. There have been a lot of cool stuff that have happened the past year, a lot of cool movement ability stuff that I've been working on, but <clears throat> nothing peak comes to mind. So honestly, I have no great insight for this question. Hmm. Uh, a couple things come to mind that I've seen you do, um, like some of the sled dragging and stuff that you would do with like oh, rounded yeah. uh, upper back and, and rounded shoulders, and then some of the movement practices that you've been getting into where you've been. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually really cool, and you and I talked about this a little bit. Um, where we're talking about breathing and maybe just breathing completely differently than what we're used to uh, when we're lifting. And that is something that I'm noticing. I was doing some back exercises in the gym today. I noticed that, you know, when it gets difficult for me, I'll hold my breath, which I actually think is like, I think for like a muscular contraction and maybe for a pump, like maybe there's something to it. Like mm -hmm. maybe, maybe because Look, the veins come out more, right? And you see, like, um, if somebody's just rowing and they're just gradually going and they're mm -hmm. just breathing normally, the, the, you're not going to see the muscles. Uh, they're not going to look the same way. Mm -hmm. The muscles won't look as angry. Mm -hmm. But if you kind of hold your breath, um, that will have a certain impact as well. But I think it's interesting that you started to adopt this idea of, like, let me see if I'm holding a dumbbell out here in this fly position. Let me see what happens if I... Let me see if I breathe through this and let me see if, where I can move my arm to. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I am, I am happy about that stuff. Um, 
you know, because like with, with grappling and jujitsu, you have to be in a lot of compromised type of positions. So the main thing that I try to just focus on is how can I develop strength and learn how to maybe even relax with load in these positions, which has helped a lot with the way that I move. So it, it's different, but it, it, it's, it's been massively helpful. It's been massively helpful. Um, cause my, I can get into certain positions in jujitsu that, most guys that my size can't really get into. Mm -hmm. And it's because I've been using strength work and I've been using weights to help stretch me out and put me in these mm -hmm. positions, which has been super helpful. Uh, but like when you mentioned the holding the breath, that is, if you're, if you're fucking deadlifting <laughs> six, 500, 600 pounds, you know what I mean? Like when you hold your breath, you, 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 you maintain rigidity. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing those types of lifts, you want to maintain rigidity. Uh, but I'm trying to lift in a way that some movements I have, I'm, I'm pretty rigid, but some movements I want to see how much I can get my body to like move, how much range of motion I can develop. I'm breathing differently picking up a fucking pillow while I'm sitting on my couch because I'm trying to like learn, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to pay attention. I'm trying to be more mindful. Like, why am I holding my breath like this? <laughs> yeah. Like I'll hold my breath like I'm going to lift 500 pounds mm -hmm. and it's a pillow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I'll reach for it and I'll notice. And why am I doing that? Well, I probably hurt my back before. You know, mm -hmm. or uh, there's tightness. And so when I go to reach to like one side, I, you know, immediately mm -hmm. the body's like, you usually brace for this. So let's brace. And so now I'm trying to learn something different. It sounds silly to uh, go through some of these things, but I think these are like big improvements. I think these are uh, big breakthroughs. The other thing that I see you do is you pay attention to like actually having markers of things that you're actually getting better at. I think in the beginning of the year, I would say like, I haven't really, didn't really see a jump rope much. Mm -hmm. And then now I see you jumping rope quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And then when I first saw you jumping rope, you looked like a normal beginner jumping rope, but now you're cruising through it pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, we, we talked about micro dosing habits a lot. And the thing that I've found is that, and we all know this if you can get yourself doing something a little bit every single day, you can really improve of that much faster than if like you have, okay, I'm going to try to jump rope uh, for 10 minutes, three days a week during my workout. If you do it for two minutes a day, that shit adds up and the skill acquisition is actually very quick. And I think it's the same thing with certain movements like an ATG split squat. I'll do that movement multiple times a day without weight wherever I am because I noticed that like, I didn't have the ankle mobility to do that well on one of my mm -hmm. sides. So I was just like, okay, well, if I can get myself to just do this movement more often mm -hmm. and make it a frequency thing rather than only during my workout, I can improve better. And that's like, that's a big habit now. Like I microdose different movements outside of the gym and then in the gym, it, 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 it helps a lot. And now you're trying time. to mess with like a one arm hang or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to hang every day. I'm probably going to try to get one of those base blocks. They have a big pull up tower thing that you can have at home that has like a dip bar machine mm. too. Um, obviously we have the thing here, so I'm hanging on it every single day, but I want to be able to increase my frequency of hanging. So I want to get one of those for at home so that like, if I'm ever at home, I can just hop up, hang for a little bit, get off and work myself up to being able to hang off of one arm. Because if I can comfortably hang my 250 pound ass off of one <laughs> arm and I can like do that. And then at some point I can fucking swing and shit mm. that that will be very helpful for my shoulders and i think everybody everybody can try to adopt that that's something that is going to be massively helpful for your shoulders and all that shit so this guy asked a lifting question i apologize that we're such pussies that we have to talk about <laughs> jumping rope and <laughs> from a chin-up bar but uh, that's all we got over here andrew you got anything that yeah. you're pretty pumped about that you worked on this year yeah it's a, it's a little uh i guess corny or like hallmark channel type of vibes but uh, watching Insima get his arm raised as he won Worlds. And then also my boy Chris, because I was like very involved with that and watching both of them win at the same, you know, event was like definitely my favorite lifting moment because they got their arms lifted up. Mm. You know, it's a little bit different, like I said, but other than that, yeah, I can't really think of any like one specific lifting moment. Yeah. Well, you cool. did your first tournament this past year. Yeah. I mean, that's like. That was huge. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know you didn't get the results you wanted, but right. at the same time, you did your first fucking martial arts tournament mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like last, last year. That's that's important. Most yeah. people will do jujitsu and they'll never compete. Yeah, I, I, I did do like, and so it wasn't like a lifting thing, right? But I did like wrestling training. I obviously started doing jujitsu. And so I did a lot of things that I've never done before. And yeah, it was, it was tough. It was a struggle, but it was definitely worth it. 
Mm. Yeah. So that was definitely a huge PR. Power Project Family Foot Health is something that we talked about all the time on the podcast. And that's why we love Vivo Barefoot Shoes. But we love them not just because they are flat, flexible, and wide, but also they don't look bad. They look actually really, really good. These are their new boots. These are their modus trainers for in the gym. These are some of their casual shoes. But when you look at a lot of barefoot shoes, some people get turned off because they don't want to wear those shoes outside. <laughs> and that's understandable. That's very understandable. But with Vivo, these shoes look so good and they're so good for your feet that they're almost a no brainer. So, well, they are a no brainer. Andrew, how can they get some of these kicks? Yes, yeah, so you guys got to head over to vivobarefoot.com slash power project and you guys will receive 15% off your order. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash power project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. <laughs> Super cool. All right, sick. We're going to get, we, we received a few more Super Chats. Holy moly. So we're going to get through again. We're going to get through all these questions and then we're going to get to all your other questions because you guys are leaving a lot of good ones. Let's also, if there's 114 people in here. If you guys can click that thumbs up button, I think it'll help you live get some more people, but no pressure. But I mean, it, it's like a, it's like a 0. 0.5 second thing. Anyway, from Daru Eckhart, at home pull up slash chin up alternatives. Hmm. You could get yourself one of those doorway things. Mm -hmm. I had one of those as a kid. Um, I, I use that thing every day. I think that that's like, it, it makes it. Uh, it, it makes you want to like step you go in and out of a room mm -hmm. and you can just do a few chins mm -hmm. or a few pull-ups it's cool but it they do kind of fuck up the doorway mm -hmm. at the end of the day though who fucking cares you can get that shit replaced <laughs> at, when uh when we had our apartment i had one of those and i had to be very careful because if i went too high my head would hit the ceiling <laughs> and like yeah you know that's just gonna be bad when you're renting a spot <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah, sometimes, sometimes they have it at, like parks and stuff right yeah spots where you can and you can obviously like kind of hang off like a jungle gym or something like that sometimes. So mm -hmm. I'd say like, you know, keep your eyes open and, and maybe do it wherever you can as well. Mm -hmm. But like maybe don't do it when there's a bunch of kids around and you're by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Might be weird. <laughs> Have you guys, I don't know what's in your neighborhoods, but in my neighborhood, there's like a little jungle gym, not, not jungle gym, but there's like a, you know, a park thing. Mm -hmm. And then they have a rock wall where you can Sick. like rock climb on shit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have that near you, but that's pretty cool. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of stuff like that. I've seen like things you can exercise on. I've seen like, um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I've seen like weird elliptical mm -hmm. trainer type things that you can use that have no electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's sometimes like a thing that has like a bar and then you can like squat onto something. Like That's how you know you live in Davis, California. The shit's yeah. everywhere. <laughs> well, I saw this when I was in like Atlanta. Oh shit. Nice. Okay. Yeah, okay. I saw this okay. when I was with... Uh, Big Mike and Big Mike's like this, this park, uh, this park has this, uh, you know, this around the track, it had all this stuff you can exercise off mm -hmm. of and stuff like that. Yeah. So. And Elk Grove, they have, they even have like a leg press type of looking thing. You just sit in a chair and it has like a, like it's just a, a spring. It, it can't be any more than like, I don't know, 25 pounds, but like it's there, mm -hmm. like it's always available and you can just go sit down and hit out a couple of leg presses. That's <laughs> Killer Mike, I meant to say. I said Big Mike. Oh, well, okay, I thought I was like, maybe he's somebody else. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, if you guys know, Big Mike's a sick ass rapper. Run the jewels. So Killer Mike. Killer Mike. <laughs> See, we're doing it again. Yeah. Okay. All right. From Marshall Baker, super chat. I am working on doing more zone two training to increase my endurance for CrossFit slash running. Do I have? Do I have need to have? Do I need to have a heart rate monitor to accurately measure that? If so, what are affordable options? This guy doesn't mm. know. <laughs> yeah, heart rate monitors are great. Um, I use the app Morpheus. I yeah. like that a lot. Morpheus will also track like your HRV, and it gives you a lot of good feedback. And uh, I believe in Joel Jameson. He's the one that created it, and I just think he's uh, really intelligent. And so I believe in his product. I, th I like it a lot. It's something that's helped me a lot with my VO2 max. Uh, but having said that, you don't really necessarily need that. Your watch is not going to give you the greatest accuracy. I don't even think it's – I think the watch can be so far off that I don't even think it's good to utilize it at all for heart rate. Mm -hmm. um, however, I would use your breathing. Your breathing is a really good target. So at first in your training, maybe you're able to jog and run at like a decent pace with breathing in your nose and out your mouth. But I do think over time it would be good to get into a practice of – mainly nasal breathing. I actually more recently, I just made a post today about this, but more recently I sort of started over with my running. What? And I'm like, let me just 
let me just only nasal breathe. Mm-hmm. Like no matter what speed I'm running, no matter what I'm trying to do, I'm only going to nasal breathe. And the only, um, if I need to switch because I'm in like danger or something, then I, then I will. Like I have gotten myself to a point where breathing's getting sketchy and like my legs are like a little weird. So mm-hmm. I've have had to breathe a little bit, um, using my mouth as well. But, um, what I'll do is rather than like discontinue the nasal breathing is I'll just walk. And sometimes I've even had to like, not only just walk, I've had to like stop, stop, rest my arm on like a tree and just, <laughs> <laughs> but ideally what you want to try to do is you want to try to have your breathing, not only be nasal breathing, but you want your breathing to be really, really calm. So ultimately I think it would be amazing to be able to run at a pretty fast pace, like to see someone actually running. I don't know if anyone knows this, but like when you see someone and you're like, that guy's running, that's between six and seven miles an hour. Anything slower than that is jogging. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anything else slower than that is, is like a little, it's like a little uh, shuffle and that's cool. And that's like, that's where I'm at a lot of times with most of my training, but I would like to be able to run with nasal breathing and to be able to run for a long period of time. And I can do it now, but it's like three to five miles. I'd like to be able to do that for 10 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles and so yeah. on. And so that's some of the goal. But if you really want to try to improve your fitness, try to pay attention to the nasal breathing, because now I've noticed that I'm nasal breathing all the time, no matter, almost no matter what I'm doing, because I'm not yes. doing anything that's that crazy. Um, even when Chris Henshaw put me through the paces of uh, some of the exercises he had me do, he had me basically run like a 400 meter. Uh, he had me push the tank and he had me do some, uh, like a sprint on the Aerodyne bike. Mm-hmm. And even through that, I was able to use some nasal breathing to recover. Yeah. So I wasn't able to do it the whole time because I'm not that proficient at it yet. But uh, over time, I would like to get there to where everything is like, Everything's kind of a breeze. So that's what I've been working on a lot. And what it does for you is it puts a governor on your training and it's going to allow you to recover from your workouts easily. Um, I ran 10 miles just like two or three days ago and it was just, it was just easy. I didn't really have running shoes on. I just had my normal, uh, those Icarus shoes on. And I just was like, ah, I just feel like running. Mm. So just took off and just ran over the, ran all over the place. Yeah. Uh, And all that was just, nasal breathing, just breathing calmly. And on top of that, I was able to run much faster at the end of my run. Um, so things are improving a ton, but I just had, I just had to take a step back because I was running faster, but you know, then this would hurt and that would hurt. I wasn't really injured necessarily, but shit would hurt. And I'm just moving around slowly. Like I'm crouching and I'm like, I don't, my body was broken from lifting. You know, I already did that. I don't want my body to be busted up from running. I want to be able to run and lift, and I want to be able to do so with proficiency and recover from all this stuff all the time. Mm. And one thing to think about, especially if, if you're someone who, because we've been talking about the nasal breathing stuff for a very long time now, so if you've been a listener of the show, you know um, kind of that it takes a while, mm. especially if you're someone who, let's say within sport, whether you're a grappler or whether you're someone who's trying to improve at you know, let's say running or CrossFit or anything like that. If you're someone who has just found yourself opting in for mouth breathing whenever things get kind of tough, and if you're someone who also uh, keeps your mouth open when you sleep, which is why we talk about hostage shape, because, mm. you know, when you're trying to focus on breathing through your nose during exercise, and then you're doing your stuff during the day, then you go to sleep and you're snoring or you have like, you have multiple times where you open your mouth at night, that's another part of time where you're training your body to breathe through your nose. Right, So that's why if you are someone who snores, that's extremely important to nip that in the bud and breathe through your nose when you sleep because that's going to help it become more natural for you to breathe through your nose during the day and when you're exercising. If you're doing all this during the day and you're breathing through your mouth at night, you're, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be harder. Okay, So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is for a while during whatever it is that you're doing, whatever form of exercise that you're doing, you're going to be consciously telling yourself and finding yourself opening your mouth. Then you're like, fuck, <laughs> you're, you're going to do that a lot because, again, that's not your default mode. But you're going to find over time you're going to have less and less time where you're telling yourself to breathe through your nose and it becomes more of a natural occurrence. And then at some point, that is just your mode. 
Like now, like I know Brian McKenzie, who's a he, he's a, one of the breathing guys. I think we've had him on the podcast mm -hmm. years ago. He has br breathing gears where initially it's nasal breathing and then it's nasal in, mouth out. And then I think it's like, uh, I think then mouth breathing when you're going at a super intense pace, but that's not supposed to be your mode, right? Um, another way that you can practice this so you can, it can become a more natural thing and I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to wrap this up so I can be quick with this. But when you're breathing, you don't want to. Most of us, and I think this is even my problem a long time ago, was I would find myself kind of breathing up here in my chest. So my default was chest breathing, right? I had to learn how to breathe kind of into my diaphragm. But for a while, it wasn't me breathing into my diaphragm. It was more me belly breathing. And then I got better at breathing, kind of breathing into my balls or diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so the thing is, is like you want to get yourself to a point where your breathing is into your diaphragm. So you're taking deeper breaths and better exhales, because if you're taking shallow breaths, it's going to be hard. But if you're taking deep breaths, it's going to be much easier. Um, so get yourself diaphragmatic breathing. And then what I like to do, I think I know you mentioned the Morpheus isn't necessary and it's not necessary. But I'd highly suggest that everyone who wants to do cardio and who wants to try to track this stuff, I highly suggest you get Morpheus. I think I think we have a code. I'm not sure if we do, but if we do or don't. I don't care. Just get yourself one of those. I use that every single morning when I do my assault bike um, because there are some, like this morning I did one of the uh, green power workouts where I'm trying to get my heart rate higher for 10 seconds, max power output. And then I have 60 seconds where my heart rate's lower. But there are many mornings where I just do 30 minutes to 45 minutes of zone two. And it's all, it's purely nasal breathing zone two, but that allows me just to practice my keeping my heart rate in that zone while always breathing through my nose and breathing through my diaphragm. It helps me actively practice that. And that will, again, for those of you who are trying to work on this, because once you get the hang of this, a lot of your stuff when it comes to cardio will become so much easier. Um, but that allows you to like practice breathing deep and breathing through your nose. I think, Andrew, there's a clip where Huberman was actually talking about nasal breathing. Um, and some people find that their nose gets stuffed up all the time. Mm. But this is a pretty interesting clip. We have it in the text thread. Yeah. But Are it, we able to pull it up or no? No, no sound? <laughs> no. Either way, if, you, if you're someone who finds like, oh, I'm nasal breathing, but my nose is always stuffed up. The thing is, is as you breathe through your nose more, mm -hmm. And this is Huberman, Huberman checked, right? But like we, this is something we notice for ourselves. As you breathe through your nose more, you will have less occurrences of actually having a stuffy nose. You use the instrument to breathe more, and it's gonna work better. That's that's all it is, you know. Wow. And you're so. using uh, all the muscles in your face, and you're using your your nose, and you're using all all this stuff here. And like if you take if you take your hands and you put them kind of like near your like almost like your cheekbones on the inside, and you actually just if you spread your face apart and you're and you're running, I actually will mess with this sometimes. You'll breathe better, but you can also breathe better by 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 learning how to use that better. You're trying to give yourself a nose like me, huh? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <You're trying> to <laughs> widen yourself. that widen that thing out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple jokes in there. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man you could i mean I, I know i never see you use it but i mean some people like to use uh no strips that helps yeah. some people out right yeah i dig the no strips i like them i just uh forget to use them a lot of times but they they work i mean it's gonna help kind of you know pinch your nose uh together but again i think the whole goal is to breathe calmly so you don't really you don't want yourself into this forced like nasal breathing i think i'm gonna die phase <laughs> you want it to be more normal for you. So you're going to have to uh, adapt to it over like a period of time. Sick. All right. The Banshee gave us 199. Oh, okay. I see there wasn't a question attached to it, but there's he a question. It up. Yeah. So the Banshee asks, my mother wants to get into weight training. She just has a few dumbbells. What did you suggest for anyone over 65 to add in some weight training? She has some athletic background, tennis, etc. Wow. Just some dumbbells. That's great. I mean, there's so much you can do. I would say probably the first thing that comes to mind is get an app. You know, get uh, Peloton. I think think I think mm -hmm. people that uh, I think people think Peloton and they think of the bike. Mm -hmm. You know, that cycling bike, or they think of the treadmill, and they think you have to have this expensive piece of equipment. But they have workouts on there for all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can follow along. Andrew might have some recommendations with stuff like that too. Um, I know our buddy Jason Kalipa, NC Fit. They have a great app, and you'll get a great workout. And it's a lot of these. A lot of these things are designed for you to work out with like minimal equipment. You yeah. don't need a lot of equipment. So if you got dumbbells, uh, you have a couple different uh, 
incremental, you know, weights, then man, you can do tons of stuff because there's so many body weight exercises you can do. And then there's so much you can do with just a set of dumbbells. Mm -hmm. And there's also the ATG app. The ATG app has quite a few programs for people who are older. Mm. Um, Ben's mom actually makes quite a few videos kind of talking about that stuff. But there's programs there for individuals who are older who help like lack range of motion and i think that's actually a good place to that's a good app to use for that because there's a lot of regressions for a lot of these movements you see people doing with great joints so like the atg split squat there's regressions for that um all these movements that require a large range of motion hey there's a there's some uh there's some movements for that so that's another place you could go I forgot my train of thought. A hot woman just walked in the room. That's and my girl, we're, man. Now That's we're all my girl. screwed up. <laughs> 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 Fucking wearing her bodysuit too. Like fucking. Yeah, what hell. is she doing? <sighs> can't, 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 can't get, can't fucking escape that woman. <laughs> and I love her. I love her. I feel like um, everybody that's like kind of in fitness kind of went through the rite of passage, which started with P90X. Oh, yeah. You know, freaking all. Did like, you guys do P90X? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab Ripper X. Yeah, yeah. All I wanted was abs. But um, so that came from Beach Body, which is now Body, which I don't really like the transition because they're trying to make it like all inclusive. So like making it seem like the Beach Body isn't for everybody and like, but your body is or whatever mm. it may be. With all that said, they have a, an entire library of workouts and you pay like one yearly fee and you have like a Netflix version, but of all workouts. And my wife does them all the time and I look at those workouts and I'm like, I don't want to sign up for that right now because that's a lot of work. But, you know, they have different options for, uh, so like each program has a regression, right? They're like, okay, if you're here, then you follow this, this, you know, actor or this lifter, whatever it is in the video. If you're a step down, like, you know, you can follow somebody on screen doing the movements. If you have 20 minutes, they got to work out for you. If you have more, they have more for you there. And mm -hmm. then, they, you know, they incorporate a lot of body weight stuff, a lot of uh, dumbbells. And then you can also just incorporate like a, a hip circle, a slingshot hip circle in some of these movements. Mm -hmm. And that'll be huge. And that's the other thing I was going to say is a slingshot and a slingshot hip circle. Allow you to do some push-ups, allow mm -hmm. you to train your butt and your hips and everything. Yeah especially for somebody who may be not able to do push-ups right now. If you get a slingshot, you're going to be repping them out. I think the tough thing is to be like motivated. You know, you have like, oh, yeah. you have dumbbells and they're just sitting there and maybe they're like in the garage and maybe the garage is cold. <laughs> um, you know, try, I guess, like really just try to set up the environment so it's encouraging. You know, um, if your mom just has dumbbells, maybe you get her, Maybe get her like a really cool uh, mat to lie on as well. Uh, that's something that's really soft, like a go mat from, uh, again, I think Jason Kalipa created that. I think maybe they sell them on Rogue. But something much thicker than just like a yoga mat. Because you want to you wanna have a setup that's like enticing. So maybe there's a couple other little things that are inexpensive that you could afford uh, to get a hold of that would be something that would inspire your mother to work out maybe even just a suggestion of hey mom let's let's take those dumbbells out of the garage and let's set them you know if your mom watches the news in the morning you know mm. let's hey, mom let's take those dumbbells um you know i got you this nice little rack to put them on and it will be nice and neat it'll be stored over here not going to be like in the kitchen or something but I, I think that that really helps a lot um that's something that my wife has done my wife has never been really that into lifting She's a division one swimmer, so she like was forced to lift and she would lift here and there. And then every once in a while she would get excited about some lifting, but she would just it would just come and go for her. Mm. With swimming, she was inspired and excited to swim because she has a whole group of people that she swims with. And they meet every morning and it's kind of like jujitsu. It's like, hey, where were you, dude? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like you're normally here at least Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Like, what's going on? They give each other shit and it's a whole communal thing. She doesn't have that with lifting. But more recently, uh, she started to get into some of the Peloton workouts. And, um, you know, from there she got fired up. And so she bought a, um, a Peloton bike as well. But even before she had the bike, she started building some good consistency with the app. So you're going to have to figure out, you know, how can you get yourself motivated? Because dumbbells are great. We could sit here and say, hey, you can do all this stuff with dumbbells. Um, and maybe uh, the three of us, maybe we would do something with just dumbbells. Uh, but we have a much different setup than that to help inspire us and to help keep us fired up with training every day. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that question was good. Mm -hmm. The next question is from Matthew Summers. 
Uh, this is another super chat. And guys, again, we will get to the other questions. There's a lot of super chats to get through, though. So apologies, because I see a lot of great questions, mm -hmm. but just can't get to them yet. Um, and 116 people in here. So thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you, guys. All right. My right shoulder mobility keeps me from low bar squatting. I regain my mobility enough to hold the bar, but my right lat and scap, scapula, are larger than the left. Feels really uneven. Just like all your other problems of sweeping right underneath the rug. <laughs> <laughs> Get yourself a giant cambered bar where the bar hangs yeah. down here. And then you don't have to worry about your mobility. Exactly. You, you never have to worry about it at all. Just keep getting stronger. Now, myofascial release is like almost always my first place for people to start. Secondarily, I think it's really important that people look into trying to find someone locally that's a body worker. Mm -hmm. Try to find someone that can help. We got our boy Oscar here in Sacramento. He's absolutely incredible. And so, you know, try to find someone that can assist you with that. And, uh, and Seema's holding up this book from a guy named Kelly Starrett. And Kelly Starrett uh, has transformed a lot of us because he's given us a lot of great advice on what to do with myofascial release, uh, particular ways to stretch, all kinds of great information in this book, Becoming a Supple Leopard. Yeah, I think it's this is a book that if you if you lift power lifter, any type of lifter, or just an athlete, I think it should be in your library because it kind of puts the power in your hands to do your own rehab. Um, if you're having, again, shoulder, scap issues, et cetera, you can troubleshoot those issues and you can figure out ways. Again, myofascial release is something that all of us do literally every single day. I think yesterday I woke up, I was feeling something in my like right lower side. I was like, okay, let me uh, do some myofascial release on my upper glute area because I know that that area is like gets tight for me. I got a big old booty. <laughs> Loosen that bitch up, beat it up, and boom, that lower back opened up. You know, it's, that's one of those things where it's like myofascial release is a habit that as a lifter, if you can build the habit, if you can learn to assess your body, find those tissues. When we talked to Ian Danny on the podcast recently, which I think is a slept on episode, he talked about soft tissue quality of a lot of the athletes he works with. You know, you touch an athlete and then there's this tissue that's gnarled up and really tight, <laughs> you know, like with being, if you're a power lifter that needs to lift crazy amounts of load, Tight tissues can actually be beneficial, right? Ian mentioned that. You can tell by looking at like, I mean, myself or like looking at like Matt Wenning, like in his prime, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you're not going to be able to push into that body you at poke all. poke that, that's a rock. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's yeah. moving. I remember uh, hitting Stan after he did a squat one time. I was like, good job. And I swatted him kind of like on a little bit above where your belt is. Where most people, like, you're going to have some body fat somewhere. Yeah. But he felt literally like smacking the monolift. Oh, like, it felt like this, like, four by four pillar of, of steel. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly. That could be good. And that could be a good adaptation for, like, you know, lifting those weights. But as far as potentially moving well and be, having minimal pain in certain areas, maybe it's not the best. Like if someone throws a Frisbee to you, for example, it's uh. just going to hit you right in the face. <laughs> it's like you try to catch it and your yeah. arm doesn't yeah. go higher oh. than this. <laughs> just catch it right in your teeth, maybe. I mean, I think that's the best case scenario. Because yeah, right? if you actually do catch it, your lat's probably going to go with it. And right. You tear your fucking <laughs> You just tear. So oh, shit. Yeah. I don't know why that came to mind. I was just thinking like, because you got to kind of track it with your eyes. And then it floats. It floats way higher than you think every time <laughs> right it does that every time you're like oh i got it and then you're like it sails jump right over yep <laughs> yeah so um <laughs> man that's that's something to think about and i think also like mark mentioned uh, i've been doing some hanging recently um and that could be something that can be helpful for you to open up the shoulder open up the scap open up the lat i know you mentioned that one side is a bit bigger than the other but if you can like get yourself to the point where like you can hang and you're able to let both of these arms relax above you it'll be uncomfortable initially but that can help loosen up those tissues along with doing some myofascial release um so it could be a big a good habit like i think one that hanging thing is something that i've personally been sleeping on but i think that's a microdose that can help everybody out because mm. you can see kids can hang forever mm. kids oh, yeah. can fucking monkey bar like they can rotate this shoulder on bars and shit super mm -hmm. easily and then after a certain point we just lose it right mm -hmm. but that if you have that ability oh that's a young body ability right there which we can all get back mm -hmm. that's a that's a podcast right there in of itself like don't ever lose it you know like just figure out a way to keep some of that shit around from the mm -hmm. time you're young because we do have probably some people that listen that aren't complete aren't completely busted up just yet. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So Hayden Pratt. Ooh. Okay. What exercises do y'all think would translate to better performance on the golf course? Okay. Hayden, 
Um, I think anything that has to do with solid rotation would be helpful for you on both sides because golf is one of those sports. I don't work with golf athletes, but golfers seem to have certain types of pain that happens because there's so much high velocity rotational force on one side of their body over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that, although it's like, it's, it can, it can lead to some unfortunate things over time. So the thing is, I think, I think you should try to get more rotational stuff on both sides of your body in the gym. That could be um, rotational slams with a med ball. Uh, that could be the, with like a cable machine, you could do thoracic rotations on both sides with a cable machine. You can regress thoracic rotations with like a band. I, I posted a video about that recently. But I think anything you can do that allows your spine to move in multiple ways. Because when you're on the golf course, your spine is doing this one form of rotation over and over and over again. So in the gym, I think you wanna spend some time strengthening all the abilities of your spine to move so that you can mitigate some of the imbalances that you're building because of the sport of golf. So Yeah, and I would, I would echo some of that. And in addition, I would say, you know, maybe get yourself to do some stuff that you're, maybe you're not doing it. Like maybe, maybe you like golf more than you like lifting and maybe you're not deadlifting, squatting or benching or doing mm. some variations of those things. I think some capacity with that would be a really wise idea. Um, you could even skip out on like doing regular deadlifts and you could do maybe like a trap bar or dumbbell, um, RDLs, things like that. And really, again, try to see if you can get some good movement from the exercise if possible, see if you can get your knuckles to touch, like your hand, your knuckles to touch your uh, toes mm. on like a stiff leg deadlift and really shove your hips way back. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a lot of flexibility and mobility through the hamstrings, the lower back. Um, you're also going to be training the glutes quite a bit. So that's not necessarily matching up with like sports specificity, but it is something that hopefully will make you stronger and hopefully help uh, kind of keep you together a little bit more. Um Things like one-arm dumbbell presses and stuff come to mind because when you're coordinating movements like that, you have to have your your hips have to be uh, in alignment with all that. Your whole body has to be able to get into that. So maybe doing stuff that's maybe not just like a regular dumbbell overhead press. Maybe it's a kettlebell. Um, doing things that are maybe just a little bit uh, more unconventional. Mm. But those are some of the things that come to mind. I also think some tools that um, might be pretty beneficial. Uh, the first one would be maybe just getting yourself a rope. <laughs> um, I think rope flow stuff could be crazy beneficial just because uh, some people are like, oh, I'm a rope flow, rope flow. But the thing is, it allows your spine, again, you're, you're able to move around in, in, in different ways. And it gets kind of fun over some time. So I think it's like it's like a bath for your spine. So I'd say get yourself a rope. One thing that's a little bit pricier, but I think could be beneficial for you would be a parabol from Functional Patterns. Mm -hmm. um, the Functional Patterns parabol, it takes a little bit of a while to get the hang of it. And it's a that little bit- That rope is pretty cool. It's a little safer. Yeah. Okay, yeah so that the, rope that you can slam. Yeah. I have a, okay. So uh, if, you, if you look at the link in my bio on Instagram, I have a link for winding ropes, which is where I got my ropes and that para rope. It's called a para rope. Um, the reason why I think the para rope or the para ball is beneficial is because when you're working with that implement, it allows you to literally, you're, you're working rotation. You're working rotation and then slamming that implement into the ground. The para rope doesn't like bounce back, mm -hmm. but the para ball, you can slam it into the ground, so rotate your spine, slam it, uh, slam it in the other direction. And there's a bunch of things. There's, it's just you're working everything in a unit. Mm -hmm. You're working these rotational forces in a unit, and then you're handling that force back when you go in the other direction. So, it, it, I mean, it, the parabol is a little pricey, but I think it could be something you could use for a very long time and would be beneficial for your movement ability, but also your ability to create force with that mm. implement. Maybe a mace or something like that might be a pretty cool idea. Get your, you know, get that mobility over your shoulders. I know a lot of golfers have, when you look at golfers, they have like elbow issues and back issues a lot. So, you're going to just want to basically try to figure out how can you make your back and your elbows resilient. Mm. I think some of those su suggestions from Encima are excellent because it has the whole body working together. And if you think about like, what do we do when our elbow hurts? We just focus on like the spot. Yeah. We just focus on the elbow, but you're like, I don't know how much sense that makes. I mean, sometimes it does make sense. Sometimes it makes sense to localize and to go after that spot. But why does that spot hurt? That spot hurts from your golf movement which you got to kind of look at like what's in the chain that's weak, that's not working mm -hmm. properly. 
it's probably not your elbow. Your elbow is just kind of along for the ride. Your hips are doing all the work in mm. golf. And so you want to really try to be mindful of that. And that's where, like, again, we talk about myofascial release nonstop. But it might be wise to do some myofascial release on your hips, your back. Try to find some areas that are just kind of junked up and start to work through them. What about something like a, uh, almost like a bodybuilding movement, but like just training your obliques, like to try to get those stronger? Absolutely. I think some of this stuff can be great. Um, I think that's where someone is going to kind of tweak their back is that they're, they're going to like, they're going to swing a golf club and they're not going to, it's not like they're going to hit the ground. You know, it's not like an immediate injury. It's not like a football player, like, you know, tearing an ACL or something. This is something where you like, you rotate and you're like, oh, I don't know. Like, well, <laughs> that was different. And then a, a couple hours, a couple days go by. It just hurts worse and worse and worse. So I think things like that that are going to help kind of keep your body together are good. I also think that you can maybe overdo some of those things and have your body be too mm -hmm. tight. So I like what Ensema is talking about with like try to be mindful of like range of motion. Mm -hmm. And so anything that's going to involve the obliques like side bends, overhead presses, the rope flow stuff, all that's going to really get into um, – not only your abdominals and not only like your core, which you hear so many people talk about, although some planks and things like that would be a good idea. Um, getting into those obliques would be would be huge. At this point, nasal breathing while you're asleep is no longer something that just us bros do, but people are realizing that it can make a big difference in your sleep quality, your recovery, and all aspects of sleep. That's why hostage tape is so important because many people have their mouths drop open while they're asleep, they're snoring, and that really affects the quality of their sleep. And that's why many wake up groggy and not feeling extremely rested. Hostage tape will allow you to tape your mouth shut even if you have a beard. Us bearded folks can put the tape on and can be confident enough that when you wake up in the morning, the tape will still be on your mouth, which will help you breathe through your nose. And they also have no strips if you're someone who struggles breathing through the nose. Those nose strips will help you open up your airway and breathe a little bit easier while you're asleep. How can they get their hands on some hostage tape? Yeah, you guys can head over to hostagetape.com slash power project where you guys can receive mouth tape and nose strips for an entire year for less than a dollar a night. Again, hostagetape.com slash power project. Links down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I just sent you a video from our guy. Um... And this teapot movement is actually something I'm going to be adding into my programming. Uh, but I think this is something that would be great for her to do. And you don't need sound here, um, but it's from our, our homie John Wellborn. Um, and I actually like if you zoom, like go a little farther. Uh, so cool mm. teapots. Um, you could do this with like a plate. I enjoy doing this like with a kettlebell and a band around the kettlebell uh, for like a little bit of, you know, oscillation. But you notice like when he's going all the way down to that side, he's really reaching. So when you do these movements, use a load that you can use comfortably, mm. but really let yourself reach, laterally flex that spine as far as you can in that direction. Um, and don't go too heavy because when you go too heavy, you're not going to be able to get the range of motion you're looking for. Right. So I like he, 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 he does this, I think we can put a link for this video, but he does these teapots with multiple stances. And I was doing this, I'm like, wow, this is pretty fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. I like doing those with the cable machine. Yeah. Um, and then what I was thinking was, um, as far as like oblique training or whatever, like something like a one-handed farmer carry, because it seems like with golf, there's so much force involved that sometimes like having good enough brakes for it all is like almost as important as like having a force to get the club going. Our buddy, uh, Andy Triana, uh, he coaches a lot of golfers, and um, yeah. he put me in contact with one of the better uh, golf coaches in the world. So maybe we'll get that guy on the podcast mm -hmm. and uh, ask him some uh, questions. But uh, you may want to also reference, like, go check out Go Super Brain on Instagram. Yeah. See if you can hit him up with a question. Um, he's been training golfers for years. I know um, Dom Saladino, uh, he also trains a lot of golfers. Um, he trained, uh, Ryan Reynolds, um, uh, as well. He trains like, you know, a lot of famous people, but he has a lot of, uh, history with training golfers. So you're probably going to find somebody, you know, follow some of these people on Instagram that are training people, uh, with proficiency in these sports. Sick. 
All right. Thanks for that question. That was that was a good question, Hayden. Um, from another super chat from Vermidian. And again, guys, we're going to get to the other questions. We just got to get through all the super chats first. Can you guys talk a bit about distended muscle bellies? How does it happen? Why? What is it? Anything to be done to correct it? Thanks for all you do. Hmm. The first thing that comes to mind is GH belly, but yeah, right. Um, yeah, like a distended abdomen. Uh, mm. Some sometimes people get like a hernia. Mm. Uh, in other cases, people uh, you know, like bodybuilders, pro bodybuilders, they take too much growth hormone. There has been speculation too around uh, maybe it's not just a growth hormone. Maybe it's a combination of the growth hormone and the signaling to eat and eat and eat. And these guys kind of train themselves to get themselves to a point where they can eat more and more. It's kind of the game for them is like, if I can make my metabolic rate crazy, like if I make my metabolic rate where I need like 5,000 calories a day, uh, when I go on a cut, you know, my body's going to be burning through fuel like crazy and I'm going to get leaner each time. But um, I think that could also be lead to it is that the stretching of the stomach may be happening a little too often. And, you know, there's, there's one thing that's kind of tough about the distended muscle belly thing because, um, you know, m most people, especially if you're someone who's like, you're, you're, you're really focused on the way you look all the time. When you breathe, you're probably always flexing your abs, right? And that may look good, but that's fucking up your breathing, like really fucking up your ability <laughs> to take a deep breath into your like into your diaphragm and because you want that area to extend mm -hmm. and you don't want to walk around with a fucking tight six pack all the time so the thing is is like i think some people when they look at social it fucks them up a little bit because they're like okay i need to keep my stomach flat too mm. but that that's causing you a lot of issues and you should be breathing into this area and it should be expanding and contracting you know so it's, it's like that's one of those things where it's like, you're I'm not sure if it's always distension for some people. Some, some people might just actually just be breathing into that area. So that's one thing. Jill Miller has a lot of great information on breathing in general and on like, not so much like gut health from a nutritional standpoint, but gut health in, in the sense of like myofascial release. She has a lot of different balls that she sells that are like some are softer and things like that, that you can actually kind of dig into some of those areas. Mm -hmm. So if the person asking the question is somebody that has kind of, they feel like they have a distended belly. Um, there's all kinds of causes for it. I mean, you could have like lordosis. Um, you could have, you know, a curved spine. Um, you could have your, your, pel your pelvis could be kind of tilted towards the ground, which you see from, from many athletes in there. Um, uh, you're going to have more of like a butt, but mm. because you're going to have more of a butt, you're going to have more of a sway in your back and <laughs> potentially your your stomach could be kind of uh, almost like forced out looking. And uh, if you're somebody that's in that um, predicament, then one of the ways out of it is through some myofascial release. You probably have to really get into like the psoas. Um, you'll probably have to get into the hips. You can check out some stuff from Functional Patterns. They have great information on how to get yourself out of some of that uh, discomfort. And... Um, that's kind of the way I see it. I mean, a lot of people have like really tight hips. So the hips, the hips are kind of tying down the, the pelvis and, and you're getting your, your butt tilts up and back and your hips start to point a little bit down towards the ground. Really, really tight quads, really tight uh, hip flexors. Something like couch stretch would be a great idea to help open some of that up, but also do some myofascial release. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Like that, it, it makes a big difference because some of these tissues are tight. They're manipulating certain joints in certain ways, right? So if you can again improve the the soft tissue ability, like your uh, soft tissue quality everywhere, you're going to stand differently. You're going to move differently. You're going to run. All these things will be improved. So, yeah. All right. Next question, Vermidian. Great question um, from Ken Borges. I have atrophy in a leg from a surgery years ago. I do a fair amount of single leg work in my programming, but looking to even out my legs. How many more sets less reps should I do with the smaller leg? Hmm. Well, I'd say this, like, uh, obviously if you're, you're trying to grow muscle in that area, you want to be eating enough food, right? You, I don't know if it's necessary that you need to do more sets and reps. You could try increasing the intensity a little bit. So if you're trying to gain muscle in that area, um, try to figure out a way to do higher reps for that muscle group. Eight, 
10, 15 quality reps close to failure. Um, and instead of just trying to increase uh, like maybe the amount of sets you're doing, just try to make sure the set quality is intense enough. Meaning that you do each set and it's like you're two reps shy of failure, two reps shy of true failure. Um, that can be something beneficial. Uh, yeah, that can be something beneficial along with trying to make sure you're eating enough food to actually grow. We had uh, Joe Sullivan on the podcast and he had a uh, pretty severe nerve damage from that squat accident that he went through when he went mm. to squat the bar and the bar couldn't handle the amount of weight that he was squatting and it bent right around his neck basically and he had an issue with uh, racking the weight and suffered uh, some injuries from that and he was still able to be proficient in deadlifting still able to be proficient in squatting but he just couldn't bench like his whole like I think left side kind of shut down and again he worked with our buddy super brain and uh they started working through some ideas and they utilized some nootropics. So you might want to look into utilizing some nootropics. Go back and listen to that podcast because Joe discussed it uh, in detail. Uh, so that's the uh, Power Project podcast with Joe Sullivan. Check some of that out because he Joe has worked his way through that. And now he's benching like a rate around 500 pounds again. Um, so sometimes I think this is a huge problem a um, for a lot of people. Uh, you see it a lot with like calves, probably more so than just about anything else. Some will have like a big calf and then the other calf will just like not be there. And there's some sort of disconnect, I think, in the nerves. You could be walking slightly differently. Um, so for this guy in particular, I think it might be good to look into some like alpha GPC. It's not going to, you're not going to take alpha GPC and like go and train and like notice some crazy difference. But over time, uh, it might help your body to connect the dots a little bit more. Maybe when you're training the leg that's smaller and you're training the leg that's bigger, like maybe pay attention to the way that you're able to contract them, the way that you're able to move them. Um, again, we talk about myofascial release all the time, but the odds of you having like a kink in the system that's not allowing you to get the blood flow and stuff that you need to the area is really, really high. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd almost guarantee it. You could probably take a ball or take something and put it in a certain area of your leg and you go, oh my God, I had no idea that was like that. And that area is not getting the blood flow. Yeah. It's not recovering the way it needs to. It's not able to keep up. I mean, pay attention to your walk. Pay attention to the way you stand. You might shift your weight one way or the other, but we all do. So that shouldn't really cause that big of an imbalance like that. So something else is probably at play. Uh, the idea of like doing a little bit more reps, doing a little bit more sets, or just being more mindful of kind of how you're doing the exercises uh, might be useful and maybe looking into uh, some nootropics to kind of add into the mix. Dude, that was a great fucking answer. <laughs> that, I did not think of that shit. Do we uh, <laughs> still have that uh, super brain nootropic thing? Do we still have that up on the, our site? I can't e remember. Yeah, the nootropics ebook. Is yeah, there. absolutely. And how does somebody get it? Just powerproject.live. Uh, I can put the link in the uh, the live chat right now. Yeah, so okay. some, of that, some of that stuff might help. Mm -hmm. All right, next question from Ben. What hacks, and okay, guys, remember, 105 people in here. When we get done answering all these questions, there will be five winners of some cool stuff. One person's going to win a year's supply of hostage tape, and it's not going to be gunpowder tea, please, again. Um, <laughs> Excuse me for one second. Uh, go for it. Forgot to mention um, occlusion training might work really well because you have to figure out how, how can you fire this leg. If that leg's not firing uh, equal to the other one, uh, maybe doing some occlusion training, especially just on that side, just to get that similar feel might be a good idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also like figuring out if you have an issue getting blood there. So maybe figure out a way to just like drive blood to that mm -hmm. muscle group prior to like loading it with maybe you're doing single leg leg presses or single leg movements. So can you use maybe a leg extension or something with a light load, just get blood to that area, get stimulus to that area and then push it. That could be something helpful. And occlusion training can help you do that kind of quickly. So if you occlude, right? Drive blood, drive blood, drive blood, and then try to do some of your normal sets. That could be helpful. And one thing too, I know you mentioned uh, the stuff from Andy Triana, like there's going to be good stuff there, but also I don't know if you're already doing this, you might already be, but try to just be super mindful about how your reps are feeling. Because some people, when they train, and this might not be you, but I see some people when they're training, they're going through the motions of the movement, like you said, rather than like really feeling the feeling that area doing the work. And if you make certain adjustments of the way your body is seated or whatever, and you're, and you're pushing with that foot, you might be able to feel it more. So really pay attention to what you feel during the movement and try to adjust yourself so you're feeling that quad or that hamstring, et cetera, doing the movement 
of or doing the work of the movement. So, all right. Now, from Ben, what hacks do you guys use to get through a cutting phase? Hmm. I think this is where you can utilize some uh, volume to your advantage and protein. So, um, you know, you want to probably try to find things that are high in protein, but not crazy in calories. So this is where you might use vegetables. You might use egg whites. Um, I'm not saying like all egg whites, but maybe you do two or three whole eggs and you do like two or three egg whites on top of that. That way your meal is much larger, but you really didn't add that much calories to it. Um, when you're thinking about vegetables, vegetables don't really add that much uh, from a calor- from a calorie standpoint. Spinach might not be the easiest thing to eat raw. You can maybe just cook it like a tiny bit and try to eat some of that. Um, you can maybe put like a dressing on there that doesn't really have a lot of calories as well, like a balsamic vinegar, and that'll taste pretty good. But as you probably have observed before, the second that you cook spinach for like one second it just it just shrinks way down so just cook it for like just a little tiny bit it might be easier to digest easier to chew up might taste better again if you cook it in the balsamic vinegar and now you have you know you have you're starting to have foods that have a little bit more volume they take up a little bit more room Mm. they take up a little bit longer time to digest eggs are amazing because you have the fat from the egg which slows down the absorption rate and and it will stick with you a little longer and if you're kind of amplifying your meal augmenting your meal with protein and you're adding egg whites to it, that should keep you pretty full for a little while as well. Um, and then I think any anytime you're trying to cut, anytime you have an opportunity to eat something that has hardly any fat in it, I think is a good thing. Again, you don't want to be like way against having fat calories. It's just that the fat calories tend to add up really quickly. So you want to keep the fat calories probably like under 100 grams, and in some cases even lower than that. But you do want to make sure you don't submarine your fat calories so much that you run into like hormone issues and, and things like that. But uh, berries, apples, uh, there's triple uh, zero yogurt, there's you know like low fat cottage cheese. These are all things you can you can eat the shit out of these things mm-hmm. almost all day. Um, protein shake, curb your appetite a little bit, but like not insanely well unless you get a ninja creamy (laughs) get a ninja creamy and you make some of those uh ice cream things Mm -hmm. those are pretty full you dump some bubs mc mc or uh bubs uh, collagen in there it will kind of thicken it up a little bit and uh again that's going to add volume going to add protein and it's going to really help to drive down your hunger quite a Mm -hmm. bit and then there's also um Mark mentioned lower fats. If you are someone who's on a lower fat diet, uh, Good Life Proteins has uh, Piedmontese on their website along with a lot of other meats. So the cool thing about Piedmontese is that we've talked about this a lot. So some of you who are new, Piedmontese beef, they have like their flat irons, which I think has 100 grams of protein and 9 grams yeah, of fat. Yeah, so the, uh, the Bavette has 100 grams of protein, 16 grams of fat. The flat iron has 4 grams of fat and I think... 40 grams of protein. Uh-huh. First, yeah. I got to check it out. Exactly. So the thing is, is like when I was on my, when I was doing my bodybuilding show in 2015, my gra- my fat was at 40 grams, 40 to 50 grams of fat. And I didn't know about Piedmontese back then. Um, so I didn't eat any red meat. I was eating chicken breast, et cetera. But like the fact that you can eat red meat while being on a low fat diet is a hack mm-hmm. in and of itself. And I don't think a lot of people know mm-hmm. that. They do have mm-hmm. other meats, like their ribeyes have a good amount of fat. They have a lot of meats with a decent amount of fat, but if you still want to eat red meat while you're cutting, that's the red meat that you want to buy because, again, you can get from your butcher or whatever, but it's going to have higher fat content than Piedmontese beef. Um, Sorry, um, two grams of fat for 23 grams of protein, and I'm pretty sure each flat iron has like two servings in it. But exactly. I, I mean, think they have like amazing. a top sirloin or something that has zero fat, in it, mm-hmm. which is okay. ridiculous. But, yeah, the, the food's amazing from Piedmontese. They ha- also have 96.4 lean ground beef. You can also check out some stuff on the website. Uh, they have grass-fed, grass-finished, regenerative agriculture, if those are things that you're uh, you're into. But I think protein leveraging, meal frequency is huge. And I think when you think about a lot of, uh, a lot of bodybuilders, almost everybody that competes that gets on stage, it's very rare that they use a lot of intermittent fasting. There might be a couple guys out there, but – and fasting can – help with a bunch of things it can help kind of partition calories to a certain part of the day and things of that nature but i think if you're on a low calorie diet 
I think meal frequency can be really helpful. So that's interesting because I was okay. So it can be helpful for someone like me. I know that meal frequency is going to be something that kind of fucks my hunger because eating super often and eating small meals often and never being satisfied with those meals mm -hmm. makes it, well, it, it. You'd probably be somewhere in the middle. Like if you were going to do a show, maybe you would eat like three times a day. I would skip breakfast. Rather than like six times or something. I would, exactly. I would skip breakfast and I would have most of my meals to be in the latter part of the day because like I'd probably have an electrolyte drink in the morning or something like that. Um, I wouldn't eat until maybe, maybe my first meal would be before my workout and maybe be a protein shake with a little bit of carbohydrates as a powder mixed in. Mm. And then I'd have much bigger meals after that in the evening because most people most people end up binging in the evening. And if I can have some satisfying meals, that'll fill me up before I go to bed right. so I don't make the mistake of the mistake of eating a lot of food uh, and binging before bed, that would be the thing. The thing is, is like I, I think maybe not many bodybuilders do fasting because it, when people think about fasting, they think about like, uh, you know, biohackers and cutting and mm -hmm. it's not beneficial for et cetera. But if you're getting in the amount of protein that you need to get in and you're still having somewhat frequent meals, you're going to maintain muscle, mm -hmm. but you're going to have, I believe you'll have better control over your hunger. And that's something that fasting that I think has helped all of us with. Mm -hmm. We like all of us can eat a lot of food, but if I decided to do a major cut, that's how I would formulate it. I'd have something in the morning, not food, but I'd have like an electrolyte thing before a workout so I could have some decent pumps. I'd have a carb uh, powder in it, maybe it's a protein shake, good workout. And I'd have two big meals afterwards. I would have all my calories in it. Mm -hmm. Then I'd fucking feel great. Yeah, so. I'd probably do the same just because I, I think that when you ha have these tiny meals, it can make you really hungry. Oh my God, it's it can frustrating. make you super hungry. But if you look at most of these guys, you look at like even a Chris Bumstead and a lot of these guys, they'll say they don't fast. You know, we have all these arguments about like fasting and not fasting and so on, but basically everyone does a very similar thing. They get through the front half of the day on minimal calories. I've seen it from just about anybody you can think of. I've seen it from Nick Bear to just about anybody. They get through a portion of the day with like minimal calories. And then they normally out of convenience kind of stack their calories later in the day. And so whether you're like completely fast or whether you have a tiny like meal in the morning or whatever it might be, um, I think that makes probably the most sense is to have, but I still think you're going to probably land on having a couple meals as opposed to like just only doing one meal a day mm -hmm. or only doing two meals a day with fasting. I think bodybuilding purposes, like you might be shooting yourself in the foot at a certain point, it might be better to have a little bit better glucose levels. It might be better to have amino acids flowing through your body a little bit more. Um, but all the fasting stuff has just gotten to be pretty crazy because, you know, we think if someone doesn't eat for like four or five hours that it's fasting. And it's not really, <laughs> it's garbage, you know? Like somebody, uh, somebody slept for eight hours and then for four hours in the morning they don't eat. And then we kind of consider that fasting, but... I don't really consider that to be fasting. When someone starts to get into like, you know, going through like a huge portion of the day, uh, 16, 18 hours and stuff, that's when I would say that's fasting. And I don't, I don't personally believe that that's amazing for bodybuilding necessarily. I, I would probably do, do something slightly different just to make sure I'm not breaking down some muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, and then Enzima had mentioned an electrolyte drink, but also just keeping yourself busy, right? Go for a walk, do something so that way you're not just at home Huge. sitting there mm -hmm. thinking about eating. Yeah, get busy. <laughs> Jerk off here and there. Yeah, take a nap. On the topic of jerking off, Crazed Corgi <laughs> asks, my front right left, my front right delt is small. Beat your meat more because your delt is worked. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get... <laughs> My, I'm, I'm getting maybe, a delt pump right now. Maybe Shit. he's using the other arm, and that's why. Um, switch it up, baby. Yeah, you got to be a switch hitter. Switch it up. All right, so that's one thing. But my front <laughs> right delt is small. What is the best way to get a lagging muscle to get the same as the other side? Maybe you're onto something, Andrew. <laughs> I've been working on it for several months. Thanks. Mm. These questions today are tricky, mm -hmm. I got to say. Again, I would just... The, the stuff that we recommended to the guy with the lopsided leg. <laughs> 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 the guy with the lopsided shoulder, follow the same advice uh, on that. <laughs> you know, examine how you feel when you're going through your range of motion, when you're doing your movements. Uh, you know, do a front raise, side raise. 
um, do some various movement and and see like I would imagine that on one side your shoulder range of motion is probably different than the other, and that's causing the imbalance. I think it's kind of cool that you've noticed the imbalance. That's that's kind of neat because a lot of times uh, people don't really notice that and they keep training and it gets worse and worse. Um, but yeah, really try to feel what, when you're doing the exercises, like kind of go inside the muscle and, and see uh, what you're feeling. Like, do you feel the right side way more than the left side? Mm. And if that's the case, then you might have to figure out ways to kind of pre-exhaust one side or you might have to figure out a way to strengthen uh, the one side. Um, I always found that like, for me personally, like lateral raises is like just a great way to just blast like tons of blood into that area. So that might be, uh, might be something to mess with. And then also, um, some like unilateral stuff, like dumbbell presses and things like that, where you, you don't have just like a fixed barbell, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe you've been benching for a while and maybe you bench a little crooked or maybe Mm. one arm is ahead of the other when you're bench pressing. So just be really mindful of that, you know, ask your training partner, ask someone to kind of watch or film some of the lifting and is one elbow like lower than the other or one higher than the other. There's probably some discrepancies going on with your training a little bit. Exactly. Uh, to expand on that, because that was what I was going to mention for anybody who is trying to work on a lagging body part. Um, things like bench pressing is great. Like hamstring curl machine is great. But if you can do single arm versions of these movements, you can I, that that helps a ton because for example when people are doing lying hamstring curls with both legs mm-hmm. they might not realize it but there's one leg that's doing a little bit more work than the other for most people there's always one yeah. leg that's doing a little bit more work than the other that's why like forever i'd always get on that machine and i would do single leg on on both sides i would do single leg hamstring curls because i knew that if i could do the the this load on this side and this load on this side at least these two places are getting that work done um so with pressing you know, you want to figure out ways that you can isolate that side and put the volume in that area. It could be with cables. It could be with uh, dumbbell pressing, et cetera. Um, and then also, I mean, the other guy did mention it for his leg, but if you if you haven't, you could maybe see if you can increase frequency. So if you're working that area once a week, twice a week. If you're working it twice a week, maybe try three times a week um, and just try to get a good amount of volume there. Space it out. That might be beneficial for you. I've seen also, it seems like when people work their lats and when they work their rear delt, it seems to push the shoulder out more, mm-hmm. makes the shoulder pop more. I think the best example is uh, our buddy Kenny Williams. Mm. He just has a jacked back and he's got some uh, rear delts on him. Um, Stan Efforting was kind of the same way. When Stan was like squatting, he just had this like perfect rear delt uh, to be able to rest the uh, barbell on. And so, you know, see if you can get your kind of work your shoulder in like a 3D manner where you're kind of working around the whole thing. Sick. All right, guys, we're, I think we're almost done answering all the super chats. There's, there's two more super chats and then I'm going to try to go back up and we'll get some more questions. So thanks for all these. Thanks for all these super chats, guys. Appreciate y'all. Now, from John Clemier, this will be a quick one. I had a dream. I had sick liver king abs. Is that doable? Mm Mm-hmm. Mark, you've seen him in person. He had a dream. He had liver king abs. Yes, Mm -hmm. he did. That's amazing. (laughs) Uh, I think, you know, the people's, uh, their stomachs are quite a bit different. You know, um, whenever I've helped somebody uh, get abs, you know, I've always been like, oh, that's interesting. Like everyone's abs seem to look way different. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing. It's like, oh, I didn't know that was under there that way. And so I think... uh, some people just have deeper kind of cuts than others. And so I would, uh, I would say, you know, the first thing is to like, you know, work on just trying to get leaner and you'll see your abs, maybe train them, work them, do some sit-ups, do some movements that, you know, are targeting a little bit of like hypertrophy in the area. You don't have to do a ton of work for them, I don't believe, because uh, they get worked kind of doing everything. And the best way to see them is through your diet. But a little bit of training for them, I think, will go a long way. And I personally just wouldn't really worry about what someone else's abs look like. I would just uh, be more concerned about getting yourself leaner and working on that over time and seeing what you end up with. There we go. That's all I got on that one. I can just add real quick because, like, I, I just know I, I didn't understand, like, how the abs even, like, worked. Like, what, why, how come that dude has, like, a 10-pack and mm. this person's working their ass off and they only got, like, you can see, like, four 
It's because like that muscle is just like technically like one big sheet and it's got that cords and stuff kind of going in between that, which makes it turn into a quote six pack or not. Mm. But all these exercises, you know, you, you can, you know, I guess technically you could try to flex like your upper or your lower, but like most, if not all exercises just do the exact same thing. So just find whatever exercises that you enjoy doing the most that you feel the most benefit from and focus on those because if it's a leg lift or a crunch or whatever, it's all just accomplishing the exact same thing. Yeah, and if you also want to pay for some sculpting, you can do that. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, now, question from 5 a.m. I don't know what that is. That is that rain? I think somebody's walking on the roof. Oh, okay. Okay. Scare the shit. Yeah, that's good. That's good. 5 a.m. <laughs> Hyper- the government trying to sneak in on our podcast. Hypertrophy cues slash tips for leg exercise. <laughs> Hypertrophy for the legs? Mm-hmm. Hypertrophy a lot for the of legs. questions for the legs today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I like this. I'm happy that people want to build some big thickies. Yeah, one of my favorite things is, is to pull the sled. Love pulling the sled. So I'd pull the sled, I think, for some distance here and there would be cool. If uh, if that's too time consuming for somebody, then you could just uh, do some heavy sled drags forward and backwards. I think it's a great way to slap on some muscle to the entire leg, you know, rather than just the quads, um, rather than just the hammies. We got quads, hammies being worked, your calves, your shins, your butt, like everything's getting worked with the sled. So pushing or pulling mm-hmm. on a sled is my, one of my favorites. You can check out the stealth sled on markbellslingshot.com. That's a good sled. Doesn't make a shit ton of noise. Um, but I think sled dragging is is really incredible. I've been using it for years and years and really love it. Yes, 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 yes. Um, tempo, baby. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That shit uh, hurts. Though. Yes, <laughs> but that's why it's so fucking good. And that's why people avoid tempo on the legs. Um, so like, you know, when you're doing a leg press or when you're doing some of these movements, like a, let's see, even a squat, like a five count on the way down can be, mm-hmm. oh mm-hmm. man. Let's think about something like a, a leg extension, I think is simple, right? So you'll maybe a one second up, two second hold at the top contraction, two seconds down, and then a one second pause at the bottom. So that's a one, two, two, one tempo. Um, but thinking of ways to enhance the stimulus that you're getting in some of these movements, I think is going to be super beneficial. Most people, when they do leg exercises, especially when they're doing leg exercises for hypertrophy, it's painful. So they do fast repetitions so that they can get through the set as fast as possible. So they don't feel that fucking burn in that tissue. Um, But we want stimulus and we want to get close to muscular failure, right? So if you're doing something for like eight reps or 10 reps or 12 reps, uh, think about the movement you're doing. Uh, Let's say that, let's say that you're doing a, let's say you're doing a squat, right? Do a two second DE centric. So two seconds down, maybe like be at the bottom, like for maybe a two, two, come up for two seconds and then a zero at the top. If you slow things down, you're going to start to feel that area work a lot. And if you can work through that, I think that's something that will help a lot of people um, get bigger legs and get bigger muscles everywhere. If you could take that concept everywhere, because now you're not avoiding that burn. You're not avoiding that stimulus that you're getting that area. You're working with it. You're working through it and you're working through it with a full range of motion. I think tempo is a big hack for a lot of people to get Mm -hmm. bigger, but tempo hurts. Mm -hmm. So most people go through the motions of the lift, get their eight or 10 reps done. And then they're like, cool, let's call it a day. (laughs) Work tempo into your lifts so that you can feel these muscles working, engaging. Um, and that's going to be something that I think can take you very far as you can learn to deal with that pain, if that you muscular were, pain. If you were uh, consulting this guy, if you were helping him, um, would you suggest that he's like at least at maintenance calories? Oh. It's kind of hard. Like it's a little harder to make something out of nothing sometimes, right? Maintenance or surplus. And before your leg days, maybe have a little bit. You don't even need to be... You don't have to be at a surplus, but it's not a bad idea. But before your harder workout days, eat a bit more food the day before. And we're just talking about like 200 to 500 calories, somewhere in that range. That'd be crazy. It doesn't have to be crazy. But if you're going to have a leg day the next day, um, this is what I did all the time. My leg days were always fucking, they're the hardest days for me. So I'd always eat a lot of food the day before because that always helped me perform better on leg days. And that's the same kind of concept I keep in mind now. Whether it's I'm getting ready for a jujitsu tournament, whether I know I'm going to have a tough day of training because I'll be doing jujitsu and lifting on a certain day, I'll eat a little bit more the day before because I know that I'm going to feel good. I'm going to be fueled for the performance I have the next day. 
I hope people didn't just tune you out right there because I think that's what happens is like they trail off because they they you know they want to be like shredded, mm. they want to be lean <laughs> at the mm-hmm. same time, and they, they like they listen to some of the other stuff like I, I hypertrophy got it you know I'll eat more like I don't know I'm gonna get chubby, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah don't think that way because it's gonna add more muscle mass and it's just a it's a time period you know and so um, how long do you think somebody should like try to target something for like 12 weeks or so or when you say target something you mean like target what their legs or something yeah like or? fuck it man i'm gonna go for it i want my legs to be bigger you just go for it for what eight weeks 12 weeks maybe maybe for the whole year you're trying to like actually like grow your legs i guess it depends you, on what you're doing if you, yeah if you're trying to grill something you're you're, you're gonna be focusing well if you're Usually, because he's focused on legs, right? But he probably also wants everything to get bigger. So you could have some training cycles that you're working more volume on your legs. And then maybe your next whatever, if you're someone who does your programming, if you do programming in that way, maybe your next cycle isn't as crazy in the legs, but it's still a good enough stimulus. Mm. If you're trying to grow, then it, it you could have sprints of higher volume. But you still need to be hitting that consistently through mm. the year. You know, there's never a point where you're not going to be working your legs. Right. You're not going to, like, do something hard for 12 weeks and then yeah. you're not working legs for another 12 weeks. Like, you're going to continue, right? So, uh, but what you mentioned is great. Like, you can have a training cycle where it's like, I'm going to hit legs harder. Because when I was working with bodybuilders and when they come off the stage and then the judge would be like, okay, your lats need to be bigger. Your shoulders need to be bigger. We would have training cycles where like, okay, we're hitting way more shoulder volume. Other, either it's more volume or more frequency on the shoulders for this training cycle. And then we're going to back off the next training cycle just because it's got, you can't maintain that volume forever. It might get boring and shit too. You'll get fucking beat. <laughs> yeah. Though that area will get, but that will actually help kind of spur that area to have more growth. Mm. So that that's that's also a very good thing to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, stuff that's helped me over the years um, was just going in different ranges of motion. So mm. sometimes I'd do stuff partial range of motion because it allowed me to handle more weight. So something like a deadlift in a rack or um, using like the, uh, uh, using the wagon wheels, you know, movements like mm. that where the movement's, Partial range of motion, allowing me to handle a lot more weight. Mm. And then also doing things like box squats where, you know, the height of the box might be like at parallel or even slightly above parallel. But other times, uh, you know, doing full range of motion um, on something like a leg press, on something like a belt squat. Some of the things that are like a little easier for me to do full range of motion on, they feel safer to me to do full range of motion on. And also like on those days, like just having the giving myself the the kind of space and grace to not put a ton of weight on there, you know, which sometimes can be hard for people because the goal sometimes is not the amount of weight. Sometimes the goal is the reps. Sometimes the goal is how you do the exercise. Sometimes the goal is the range of motion. Um, so all that was really helpful for me. And I got to say, we said this multiple times, but I mean, it's going to come up again. Myofascial release, <laughs> yeah. man. Because like, especially when you work legs over and over really, really hard, um, you develop a lot of tightness in certain areas. Like, uh, and, and, and don't neglect your adductors and your groin area because especially as you're working quads, hamstrings, quads, hamstrings, this inner thigh area just becomes very underdeveloped versus your quads and your hamstrings. And that, that's not good. So in the gyms, you can use your good girl, bad girl machine. That's a good thing to do. Um, I've also talked about like growing stuff on my Instagram. You can add that stuff in, but don't neglect that. Don't neglect your adductors, your inner thighs, your groin, because for most people that ends up being very weak because they've always been focusing on legs and they've been missing this inner part of their legs that has a has crazy amounts of use as far as its function. And when you're posing on stage, when you have like that area can hypertrophy, your sartorius, that those inner thighs, your quads will look even bigger because your inner thigh area is Mm. larger. So that'll help you have more substantial looking legs. So don't neglect that. Sumo sumo, uh, deadlifting, you got uh, Mm -hmm. wide stance squats, like all that stuff, really target that area. And just in general, for anybody listening to this that is looking to grow any muscle, you know, you got some, there's like some laws to hypertrophy, you know, there's some like rules and you want to probably be within 40 to 60 seconds time under tension. So that means you're set. Uh, That's usually why 10 to 12 reps is prescribed because it takes X amount of time to do that. So when you do your reps, you're not like going like hell, like a million miles an hour. That's not going to really get the desired result that you're looking for. 
Uh, normally you do two to three sets of two to three exercises two to three times per week to target a specific area. And maybe it's a little bit more than that for somebody. But that, those are some of the simple rules. And when I say two to three sets, I mean like two to three good like working sets, mm -hmm. sets that were challenging, sets that were difficult, not like you just got to the gym and you're still warming up and stuff. Those don't count. And even like the back off sets and stuff that you might want a little extra pump from, I don't think those count really as, as much either. And those a lot of times are probably more detrimental than they are mm. helpful, but they can just sometimes be fun. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you can't build legs with squats because obviously you can. But if you are focused on the hypertrophy stuff, don't think that like, you know, just squatting is the answer. And if it is, maybe get your heels up so you get more quad uh, mm, activation. Good point. Uh, don't be afraid of the Smith, Smith machine for the same, you Another know, for point. some reasons or same reasons and Smith that sort of thing. Great. And uh, yeah, so just like don't get locked into just squatting. For, uh, don't get stuck into thinking that you need to just barbell squat to grow the legs. Tons of tons of equipment out there. It takes a long ass time to learn how to squat. That too. could take you a few. Sometimes it takes people a couple years. I'm still learning. <laughs> I yeah, I feel like I'm still trying to figure it out. Like it's it's a tough exercise to really get down in terms of trying to specifically target your quads. What Andrew said, hit that Smith. Like really hit that Smith. I used to use the Smith machine a lot. It makes it so easy to target your quads and focus in on it because you you can literally squat in a different it's way. Not hardcore, bro. Oh, oh dude. <laughs> well, I mean, Bumstead uses the Smith. Well, he's not hardcore. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> he's getting called out. Hey, there we go. All right. I agree. I agree. It's time to step up your wardrobe. Now, we've partnered with Viore Clothing because their clothes are stuff that you can wear in the gym, but also on the go to a dinner, on a date, pretty much anywhere. This is their Strato Tech Tank, and this is their rain shirt jacket. You guys have probably seen me wear these types of combos on this podcast for a long time now. And the stuff is super comfortable. It fits super well. And the Winter Monster is coming. So you need to get yourself some nice long sleeve wear from their website. They also have a lot of other stuff like their Strato Tech Tee, their core shorts, which they have a ton of different colors, and they're pretty damn amazing. Their Ponto line, their Ponto performance line with their dream knit fabric is super soft like a baby's bottom as weird as that sounds <laughs> um they have a lot of amazing stuff on their website their boulevard shirt jackets aspen shirt jackets their sweaters let me let me show you something real quick this is their echo insulated jacket and it is so warm and since the winter months are coming i'm going to be rocking this so much more guys there's endless stuff for you on their website that just looks so good and performs so well how can they get it you guys can get it over at viori.com slash power project that's v-u-o-r-i dot com slash power project and you guys receive 20 percent automatically when you go to that uh links down in the description as well as the podcast show notes next question from i think it's supposed to be levec but scott levesque uh thank you for the super chat scott and if i said your name incorrectly i'm not sure what it's supposed to be dude i i don't know what's your thoughts on peptides and using them i don't know why you're looking at me <laughs> <laughs> I don't think peptides uh, do a ton, but I know people are are pretty big fans of them. We've had people on the show talk about peptides uh, a bunch, and I guess I shouldn't say that I don't think they do anything because the class of peptides is just huge. I think there's like over 700 different peptides. Yeah. So it can be kind of confusing. But some of these ones that uh, they'll tell you that it will help increase growth hormone and stuff, I don't really think they're that effective. Um, there are peptides that are really effective. I mean, um, Ozampic is a peptide, um, mm. and that is helping a lot of people that really need it. It's helping a lot of people lose weight and it's changing some people's lives. I would just say, you know, you know, research this stuff, pay attention to it. Uh, I would say that doesn't seem like this, uh, these peptides have been out long enough to really get, um, quality information on whether they're going to hurt somebody or not. I think one of the things that's enticing about peptides is that they're not steroids. And so people are thinking they're going to get away with something because they're taking something that's not steroids and maybe this will be less harmful. But we don't really know any of that yet. So in terms of can they cause like a similar amount of harm, I would just say pretend that they do. And then that way you can kind of make your choice from there on whether you want to uh, get into messing with peptides. How about like the uh, like amino acids and that sort of thing, the, like injectables? Are those considered peptides or are those just amino acids? Yeah, you know what? I'm not sure because peptides are amino acids. I know uh -huh. Joe Rogan recently had a guest on 
can't quite remember the guy's name, but he owns Ways to Well, uh, oh, okay. yeah. the company they talk about quite a bit on that show. Um, and that guy talked about peptides and the laws around peptides, and he talked quite a bit about um, peptides and, and some of the efficacy of those things. Again, I have seen people um, where I haven't I haven't seen somebody in a long time, and then I see them. And it's like, oh shit, like that guy, we call it the dark side. Like when uh -huh. that guy went to the dark side, the guy clearly like got on some shit. And when we say shit, like we mean testosterone usually. It's the only thing that I've ever seen make that big of a difference. I've never seen it be the case where it's like, oh shit, that guy's on growth hormone. Or oh shit, that guy's on creatine. Or oh shit, that guy's on. I have also seen drastic results with people taking Ozampic as well. I've, I've, I've noted that, I've seen that. But uh, yeah, you don't really see that, you know, with, uh, you know, oh, someone's taking Samoralin or whatever this peptide is. Like, you don't, I've never seen anyone come through here uh, looking like they're going to like rip the door off the hinges because they're on peptides. But mm. I have seen people come through the doors <laughs> where they're on a lot of testosterone or trend yeah. or whatever the fuck <laughs> it might be. And they look like they're going to rip the doors off this place. Get your blood work done. Um, well, you said a test. So I got my blood work done and there was a suggestion for, I think, Tessamorelin, but I haven't done it because I don't like needles. Um, so uh, it, they probably can be helpful. And Merrick, like, you know, if there are peptides that could be beneficial for you based on your blood work, that can be suggested. And then you can also ask questions because they, the patient care coordinators, if you have something that you want to try to use, um, they can give you advice on how to use this stuff mm -hmm. safely. So I heard somebody say something so crazy the other day, but I thought about it a little bit more and I thought, shit, that's amazing. Oh, let's hear it. I want to kind of look into it more and learn more about it. But he basically just said, if your body makes it, you shouldn't take it. And I was like, holy mm -hmm. shit, that's super interesting. So this guy meant like vitamin D. He meant any mm -hmm. anything your body makes. He wasn't a fan of you uh taking it. And it was um Jack Cruz. He was on a podcast with Rick Rubin and Huberman. And they were going oh. back and forth on some of that, uh, on, on a bunch, bunch of different crazy information that was awesome. He said, if your body makes it, you shouldn't take it. If your body makes it, you shouldn't take it. Because sometimes people are like, well, testosterone, you already make it. So, like, you know, who cares if we blast a little bit of it? <laughs> but he was like, no, nah, like, I think it works opposite of that. It's just, it's interesting. I think it, I, you know, um, mm -hmm. you could you could get on one side or the other and you can, um, you could be so blinded by you know, what's actually healthy, you know, like is taking a lot of testosterone healthy? Yes. Probably. Yeah. Probably. It's probably straight. No, uh, <laughs> it might have, it might have, it might have its usage for certain people, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, is it healthy? <laughs> just, is it healthier to probably just let your body naturally do what your body can naturally do? And is it in your best interest to pro probably try to explore a bunch of that as much as you can? I think so. I think it may, that, that makes the most sense to me. Mm -hmm. But our environment doesn't allow our bodies to naturally do what it's supposed to do anymore. That's cope. What are you talking about? I think that's okay. Like, okay, I hear people say this shit so much. And in some cases, I get what you're saying. Air fresheners and the water and shit. But like, I think it's cope because if you fucking take care of yourself, if you eat right, if what you get the sleep, fuck plastic the microplastics, everywhere. dog. Like, <laughs> nah, man. Like, nah. If if you eat whole foods, if you get sleep, if you actually just like, if you do your part in taking care of yourself, there will be these environmental factors, but they're not mm -hmm. doing so much that they're fucking you up that much. Mm -hmm. Like, there's there's a few things that aren't in our favor in the modern Western world, but at the same time, like, if you take care of yourself, dog, this environmental shit, I think it's important, but it's still a cope. When people use that and they say that shit seriously, that's a cope. Because I know you're not sleeping as much as you can. I know you're not taking care of your light at night, which you can be fucking taking care of that shit. You can handle your environment, right? If you say, oh, it's the environment, like, you can, you can, you can fucking adjust that. Cope. Yeah, you can stay home, never go no, no, outside. No, 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 no. I know you're taking it to the next level. It's not stay home and never go outside. So, no, you got to go outside and get sun under a cover of uh, <laughs> copper so that way you don't get exactly. any of the Wi-Fi no, yeah, no, it's it is a cope, but it's just you know it's fun for conversation. Yeah, yeah, we're we're in just like an abundance, you know. It's yeah, a, we we have abundance of stuff, which is great. You know, we should be grateful for that. And even getting a conversation over like, should I take this amount of testosterone? <laughs> like, it's kind of a 
cool conversation to be able to have. It means you're mm-hmm. healthy enough to even get to that point yeah, in the first place. It comes right in the mail for you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, guys. There's, there's, uh, okay. Thank you for all the super chats because I, <laughs> there's some good questions that haven't been asked with super chats, but the thing is, is we have to get to the super chats first. So there's two more super chats and then we're going to get to your other questions. Let's just get uh, better. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Alberti. Alberti. Love you guys. Keep doing what you do. One question though. What is your opinion on Theraguns? You guys speak a lot about myofascial release, yet I've never heard you guys mention a Theragun. Why is that? Gracias. Thank you. Hey, if you can use something and it's convenient and you like it, then that's great. I, I don't really think much of them. I think there's like better practices. I think there's better things to do, but I have a few friends that use those religiously and they like them a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a Theragun. At, I think I have a Theragun and something else at home that I've had for a while. But the thing is, it's like I use these harder implements and these, mm-hmm. the, these balls by Jill Murray, which are much cheaper um, that I just haven't touched in in a while. I think it could be beneficial for areas that I can't hit with like a – supernova right one of those this kelly strut mm-hmm. supernova or any of like a med ball from amazon which we use a lot on the quads so for areas like maybe my arms and shoulders where it's a little bit harder to get maybe it mm-hmm. can be helpful for that um, but i still try to get those areas with pressure from my body putting it either i'm on the ground and i'm putting that pressure on top of that ball or i put something in my trap like whether that ball and i dig that jill miller ball into my trap and try to relax into it that i feel is much better for me um and that's why i just haven't used those in a while mm-hmm. yeah but that percussion of like the thing like kind of just like hitting the area over and over again i don't think it's the same as like getting that like constant pressure mm-hmm. and then finding the area that kind of sucks and you have that constant pressure in there and then you're almost like kind of scraping through it or you're moving your arm sort of through it um it's just kind of hard to get that same feel from like a theragun or any of those other guns um, it doesn't mean that they're completely worthless, but um, I don't really, I don't use them and I don't use them because I don't feel that it works that great for me. Because they're hard to use them on yourself. Like That's you need somebody thing. else to yeah. do it and then like that feels pretty good. But yeah, not the same way like a uh, lacrosse ball on the floor. Like it just, it feels better doing that. They do make ones that you can like. You like cut, a post or something? Yeah. You can, well, you can kind of like hook them around mm. like a. You know, like the Theracane thing where you can kind of hook mm-hmm. and you can get into like your trap. But I've never tried one that's like that before. But that's super interesting. It's mm-hmm. got like a hook to it and you can kind of dig it into your back. Probably feel pretty good. Mm-hmm. All right. That was a good one. Also, thanks for the $20. Damn. All right. From Ray Andrew, 999. You guys are amazing. Shout out from Los Angeles. I'm 36 and curious about starting my anabolic journey. Ah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It sounds like I'm going to start my anabolic journey. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, oh. uh, goals, part aesthetic and part test increase related. How would I go about this in the best way? Oh, man. All right, guys. The two experts chime in. I mean, you got to do it right. Got to go to Merrick or something. Like, figure out what your blood work is right now, where you, you stand. Because, fuck, without that, you're just... I mean, I know it's, it is kind of fun to just throw darts at the wall and be like, I... <laughs> Yep, that looks good right there, but, you know, I mean, shit, you might have really high test right now, so, like, who knows? Yeah, I I don't know, but I guess I would start there, though, test. (laughs) It's hard to give people advice like this, you know? Dangerous. Yeah, it is dangerous. Um, I think it's a good idea to to, to just think about it a lot, you know, and and at at this point, this person has probably researched it a bunch. They probably already kind of made up their mind. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, they got like, you know, one, one foot in already. And so you may as well just kind of jump in. But I would say with my experience and from what I've seen from most people, somebody being in a 200 to 400 milligram range of testosterone has a huge impact on their, on their strength, on their build, uh, on their confidence. And so that might be a pretty cool place to start. I do agree with Andrew that, um, especially if you don't have that much knowledge, you're, you're better off trying to go somewhere where you, there is knowledge. Um, but I realize sometimes that can be expensive. Sometimes that's not the easiest thing to do. Um, and for me, you know, I, I didn't start out that way. I didn't start out having like a physician. I didn't start out having blood work done. My mind changes all the time on all this stuff. But for most people, they don't 
really understand probably what they're getting themselves into. Mm-hmm. And um, it's cool that you called it a journey because it kind of is. And you're, <laughs> you'll probably be wrapped up in this journey for a long time. If you're somebody that has um, anger, uh, if you're somebody that uh, isn't very patient and things like that, you might want to just try to ask some other people that you know that have taken testosterone before um, and try to find out from them and see what their experience is like. Because I'd hate to see you like, you know, get on something and then you're you're already kind of angry <laughs> or you already have uh, trouble controlling your anger and then it gets worse. Anxiety too, right? Some people get anxiety from it. I know some people that have taken a shot and uh, had they had to go to the hospital like just shortly after because mm-hmm. they had like shortness of breath. Now, I don't think there's any possible way that the shot that they took mm-hmm. gave them shortness of breath, but they like panicked afterwards. Mm-hmm. And so f- it's a big deal for somebody to do this. But if you talk to a doctor, you talk to somebody uh, like say like at Merrick Health and they explain everything to you. And they say, here's how it works. You know, it, it's going to take like weeks for this stuff to kind of get into your system and for it to be an advantage and for you to notice differences in the gym. You're not going to take a shot and then like all of a sudden, it doesn't feel like coffee. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like an energy drink. It doesn't work that way at all. You're not going to take it and then like punch out your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> It's nothing like that. It's, you know, you've seen it portrayed that way. If you do, just blame the testosterone. Yeah. It's that bottle of testosterone yeah. over there. I love you, babe. I didn't want to do that. It wasn't me slapping. It was the test. Mm-hmm. It's the test. I'll lower the dose. <laughs> so it is good to, you know, have someone around that has some uh, knowledge of uh, what it is you're doing. But like I said, two to 400 milligrams is usually a good starting place and it usually gets people pretty jacked. Yeah. And, and just to add, like, yeah, you won't feel like if you took an energy drink or something, but I mean, you kind of do mentally feel like, like, Oh, I'm now enhanced. Like this mm-hmm. is awesome. And you, you know, magically you feel stronger and you have more confidence. You're walking taller and all that. It's, it's it, there's a mental thing, which also there's a mental thing. So if you come <laughs> off, all of a sudden you're not standing as tall and those weights got a little bit heavier. So just things to keep in mind that, you know, it's, it's cool for right, you know, in the moment as you are experiencing the benefits. But if you decide one day to come off of it, those benefits are probably going to be gone. Quick question. And this is for context, like both, both you guys are on test. Do you guys have any short term plans of coming off? Not really. Right. No. How long do you see yourself continuing? Andrew, like, Till they run out of test, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, no, I, it feels awesome. That's, like, yeah, and that's. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. This mm-hmm. it's a good thing that it feels awesome. But the thing to understand is, it's a life altering decision. Mm-hmm. You're not going to take tests for a few weeks and then come off. Mm-hmm. You're going to take test, and you're going to keep taking tests for a while. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. understand, like you're making a monetary investment to continue paying for test, and then you're also making a life like investment because you're going to need to continue taking test every single week. Mm-hmm. I have thought about it many times of like coming off it. And then I slap myself in the face and I take another <laughs> shot. <laughs> you double it up for Say, that you week. pussy, what's going on? <laughs> Somebody switch out my testosterone, the estrogen. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> no, I have, I have thought about it many times, but I'm in like a little bit of a weird predicament. Um, I'm not old, but um, I'm at an age where you do see a lot of people uh, looking into TRT. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people that are in my, I'm like 47, so... A lot of people, you know, between 45 and like 50 something are looking into uh, TRT. And so I don't really know what would happen if I came off. I wouldn't mind trying it. I wouldn't mind trying it for like a few months and stuff like that. But I also, uh, I just don't feel I'm ready for that. And I'm like, let me not do that while I'm like in the spotlight all the time or mm-hmm. putting myself in the spotlight. I'm not necessarily in any spotlight except for the <laughs> my, <laughs> my own ones that I set up here. <laughs> but uh, I would probably, what I would probably do is I would, because I do think that there is, um, sometimes there's some privacy to like medical stuff. And so like if I was to take on that journey, um, I wouldn't want to take it on with a lot of other people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I would be fine with someone saying, hey, you look smaller and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But why even bother having that influence there? Like I'd probably want to, I'd probably want to step away from stuff for a while and just kind of handle it myself and go through it sort of like not necessarily on my own with friends and family and stuff like that. But it would be a big deal. 
It would yeah. be a big deal. I've been, I, I've like, this is what I know of myself for the last, you know, nearly 20 years. So this is what I've gotten used to. Dude. Awesome. Okay. That was, that was y'all killed that answer. Okay. Now we can get to some questions, Let's some go. other questions. Okay. From Rock Humber. <laughs> Question, how often should you choose to change focus on your training plan in mesocycles? Like, should you stick with the same training for several blocks in a row before changing things? Um, so it kind of depends on your movement variability. If you feel that you have enough movements that hit your biceps in, a, in certain ways, then you can keep progressing those movements. If you have like, let's say your shoulders, if you have presses, lateral raises, uh, rear delt pulls, uh, front raises, if, if you have different ways of hitting the shoulders and you can continue progressing them, go for it. Uh, I think some people switch up their training plan so often if they're, if they're using a specific program, they switch it up so often that they never really give themselves a good amount of time to progress at a specific movement. And with the goal being, if your goal is primarily muscle growth, it's a good idea to let yourself actually improve at a specific movement before totally switching to something else. Um, but there doesn't mean that it's bad. Like you can, again, if your goal is just purely muscle growth. Uh, for me, I do different movements quite a bit. I add in movements here and there. Um, but my goal isn't purely muscle growth. My goal is finding weak links as far as my movement's concerned and developing those weak links so that they become strengths. Um, so yeah, I, I would say don't switch so often before you actually improve at something, but give yourself like, you know, it doesn't need to be within one mesocycle, but maybe every eight weeks, cycle like a lot of movement here or there that you feel like you've kind of like tapped out in terms of mm. your ability to improve at it currently. Yeah. I remember when I was young, I would like, you know, write stuff down and I was really paying attention to a lot of the stuff. And I would do, you know, say like dumbbell shoulder presses and like mm. week in and week out, I would improve on it. And I'd be so excited and so pumped. But sometimes you start to kind of max out your capability of what you can do in some of these areas. And so sometimes from there, you need to switch it up. But just as an example, sticking with like an overhead press, you know, you do like a seated, say like, you know, military press and you do sets of 10. Um, if week one, you know, you do a set of 10 with 50 pounds and then week two, you kind of like just switch up your training because you're bored. You feel like doing something else. You do like front raises and lateral raises. The stimulus is different. And so it's kind of hard to like track. Now you're not sure, you know, the third week comes around and now you do your shoulder press again. And maybe you use the fifties again because you didn't really stick with it for a long enough time to start to get better at it. And my advice would be very similar to Insim is like stick with something for a little bit. You'll actually just get better at something. Um, not necessarily because you get stronger, you get better at stuff at first, uh, because of like a neurological adaptation, you're used to the movement. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, someone showed me this movement last week and you go to do the movement and you're like, oh, I remember that that's done this way. And now 55 pounds is a little bit easier and your, your muscles and your body is going going to recognize that there's a different intensity going on. There's a different amount of work being done here. And over time, your body's going to respond to that with muscle growth. Over time, your body's going to respond to that uh, in gaining muscle mass as well. So you may as well push that for a couple of weeks and see where you can improve. And it wouldn't only be with the weight. You could also improve upon the reps. You also can, like, there's still so many things. I think this is what people are missing a lot of times. There's so many things to switch up, yeah. even within doing a same exercise or a very similar exercise. You know, you could, if you are bored and you do want to switch things around and you've been training for a while, well, week one, you could do a shoulder press. Week two, you can do like an Arnold press. Week three, you can do a standing overhead press. Week four, you can do a barbell overhead press. Week five, you can do like behind the neck mm -hmm. overhead. You know, you can just like, you can just go on and on and on and keep kind of switching it slightly and maybe for that person, maybe their goals are a little different. Maybe they are trying to think like, I want to attack the shoulders in like a, so many different angles that that way my shoulders are flawless in terms of their mobility and their strength within these ranges. And maybe you're thinking like every time I come down on the lift with the barbell, I want the barbell to touch my shoulder or my thumb to touch my shoulder, full range overhead. 
and you have slightly different goal rather than just uh, increasing the weight. But I'll just kind of finish by saying, I do think it's important that you keep some sort of structure to your lifting in the beginning. Um, you know, once you kind of get accustomed to the gym period, once you get accustomed to the gym and you're trying to actually make progress, I think that's where you need the variables, variables to be the same because how are you going to know if you're trying to like get better at like a hundred meter dash, how are you going to, how are you going to know that you're better at it if you're running 20 meters and then you run 200 meters and then you run 50, like if you're doing everything so uh, sporadically, it's very hard to track and to pay attention. I also find it really motivating. I found it for myself when I would write, st the reason why I got so obsessed with like writing stuff down is I'd look at the numbers from the week before and I'd be like, oh my God, this is going to be so cool. I get to go a little heavier on this. Mm. Um, or if I did lift heavier, I was super excited. I was like, oh, this is awesome. Mm. And uh, hopefully, you know, oh shit, next week I might be able to use the 80s. You're like, what the, this is going to be mm. awesome. Yeah. So it can be inspiring too. All right, cool. Next question from Valerie Page. Looks like my question got caught off or something. Was asking about sled drags. Where to start? Good starting sled and straps. Recommendations on how to do it outside. Terrain, tips, any advice? There's so much. Oh, my God. There's, there's a lot to choose from when it comes to sleds, you know. Um, like pushing a sled, I think, has a different impact than uh, like just towing one or pulling one. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems to stress uh, your body in a slightly different way. Um, but obviously I'll recommend our stealth sled. You can get that over at markbellslingshot.com. Rogue makes a lot of great sled, just a regular standard metal sled. Um, but I do think that, you know, dragging the sled forward, dragging the sled backwards. I do think that those are so, those movements are so simple um, there's not really like a ton of stuff to keep in mind. I would say at first though, I would say don't overload the weight on the sled so much that, um, you are like really just leaning your body weight into it. Yeah. I would leave that. I would leave that to maybe some other time, like as you get more used to it. But what I've found is sometimes with about, about three to four plates, um, if I walk with three or four plates and I walk deliberately just forward and backwards, sometimes even only two plates, that that feels absolutely incredible. And I'm able to like target my muscles better. I'm able to feel my body a little bit better. Uh, I'm able to work through my calves and through my feet a little bit better. So I would kind of recommend that you start out with like kind of modest weights, maybe go, I don't know. Uh, maybe 50 to 75 feet, something like that. It doesn't have to be super specific. Like for us, we just go back and forth on the turf, and I think the turf ends up being about 30 yards. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, I do think it, it's going to be important for you to stack like a decent amount of weight on there and to um, get used to pulling some some heavier weights because what I've learned with the heavier weights, the heavier weights really get into like the Achilles, and it really just gets into some... Uh, cool muscle groups that otherwise uh, are just sort of tough to get into when it comes to training in the gym. And then I know Ensema has really liked using straps and all kinds of different things when it comes to pulling a sled. Yeah, the uh, shake strap is really great for sleds, which whatever sled you use, it works great on the stealth sled. It works great on any sled attachment. I think uh, the shake strap in general is just a good attachment to use uh, because like I use it on almost every single movement I do on the cable machine because it allows you to kind of like, it allows you to just like grab in different ways. And the oscillation of the strap adds a different kind of stimulus when you're doing biceps rows mm -hmm. or whatever type of thing you're doing on the sled or that you're doing on the cable machine. And then the cool thing about the shake strap, I don't know if Andrew, you could pull up my Instagram and you can pull up that sled Bible post I had um, because the shake strap allows you to kind of strap the your arms through each side and it's long enough where like you can pull the sled in many different ways in many different positions with a rounded spine with a flex spine extension you could coil it like we've learned from david weck it allows you to pull the sled in a lot of different bodily positions which is why i really like that attachment for any sled you have you can use it on one of those torque fitness sleds 
Um, you can use it on, of course, the stealth sled, anything. But it'll allow you, like like showing here, it'll allow you to just kind of like sled in a bunch of different ways. And I think the cool thing is that the sled, like right here where I have the shake strap around my arms, the sled is pull trying to pull me in that direction as I'm walking backwards. And it's a, it's tr I'm trying to keep my scapula in place so that I don't lose position, which will help strengthen your scapula and strengthen different positions. So I think that shake strap right there, along with any sled, is gonna just allow you to do a bunch of different things with your sled. There's a lot of sled information too and videos in your ONTAP program, I believe as well, right? Um, I don't have all of this in the ONTAP program. Ah. I talked about the sled a little bit in ONTAP. Um, I'm gonna add more sled stuff to the program soon, but not everyone has access to the shake strap. So that, that's not something I added in yet, but I will. And in, in uh, the ATG app, I'm sure there's tons of sled stuff recommended by Ben because Ben has really helped put the sled on the map. Yeah. Yeah, there's a tons lot of stuff ways. in there. But the shake strap is like, <clears throat> I didn't, until I until I just started fucking with putting my arms through it, I didn't realize how good of a device it was for sledding. Mm. And then it's just like, it, it, it allows you to do so much, man. Like, and it's just fucking a stretchy strap with loops. <laughs> <laughs> it works great. It works great. I uh, also want to just, you know, kind of give this person like, just uh, a little bit of a protocol. I would say, you know, pull the sled, let's just say twice a week. I think that's a really good start. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, I would also say like, you know, how far to pull it, you know, I don't know, maybe pull it around a hundred feet or so. Um, again, it's, I don't think it's really that important that you measure it out, but maybe you just go for like, you can also look at your phone. It could be like 30 seconds to a minute or so, and then turn around and pull it back the other way. Um, I've done it so many different ways. I've done it where I'm like, all right, let me stay on the hamstrings, glutes, and calves, and I'll pull the sled forward, and I might do that for six minutes at a time. A few, you know, I might just keep going back and forth and just have that little rest in between of, uh, you know, just turning the sled around or whatever it might be. And then more recently, I've been doing like longer sled drags where I'll pull it for 20 minutes. That was recommended by Ian Danny, and I will pull it around the building of super training and i'll just kind of pull it whatever way i can like as soon as my legs get really exhausted i'll just flip and i'll start pulling it backwards backwards forward and so on mm. but anyway two to three times a week and i would say maybe about about four sets or so uh walking forward four sets walking backwards and if you want to get fancy with it you can start mm. to mix in some other ways of uh doing a sledding walk sideways with it you can do some pulls and some rows and stuff like that too Pat Barch family on the podcast, we talk all the time about feeling good, good habits to make sure that your health is in check. And one of the things that's super important is getting your blood work done because you could be getting great sleep, you could be having great nutrition, uh, but under the hood, there could be things going on that you don't realize. So it's always good to get your blood work checked so you can totally understand what's going on. Now, the thing is also, when you get your blood work checked, there's so many different things and so many different numbers that it's hard to tell what's good, what's bad, and how do I optimize things? And that's where Merrick Health comes in because they have patient care coordinators on staff that can help you interpret your blood work and then give you the necessary recommendations as far as supplementation, nutrition, and if you need it, hormone optimization that'll start moving you in the right direction. Andrew, how can they get their hands on it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com slash Power Project. At checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off the Power Project panel, the Power Project checkup panel, or any individual lab you select. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. There we go. All right, guys, another super chat. Thank you, Marsha Reed. And uh, remember, guys, we're going to get to the super chats and then we're going to get back to all the normal questions. So Marsha asks, recovery tips for arthritis, knees. I'm OK working out, uh, working around it during workouts, but after or the next day, I'm really hurting. Hard to know when it, it will flare. Mm. So the first thing I'll mention is like um, walking backwards with a sled. You know, like we were just talking about sleds and walking backwards with a sled is going to great because like. You know, this is a uh, Ben Patrick. He talks about like how it gets you in that knee over toe position automatically. Mm -hmm. So you can walk backwards outside, which is something my mother does. She's 65 years old. She'll take walks and she'll walk backwards on walks. And I'm going to try to get her a backwards treadmill because that's going to be something that's going to be good for her in the living room just to like mm -hmm. for, for her knees. But that's going to be helpful there. Um, there's a bunch of movements you could do, but 
I would suggest getting the starting that zero program that's on the ATG app. Um, ben he made a program for people for knee issues, um, which requires zero equipment. Uh, and there's all these regressions for where your knee is currently. Because even if you have arthritis, people have managed to work their way out of it, but it's kind of by going into it. You know, uh, a majority of people, when they're told they have arthritis mm -hmm. in certain areas, they kind of just avoid that area. They use it less, there's less blood flow to the area, then it continues to get worse. But if you can slowly attack it with certain movement regressions, you might notice that your arthritis doesn't end up being as much of an issue a year from now. So. I think we forget some like just stuff that's been around forever, um, but like sit just sitting in a squat position, like it's great. Like you get that knee to kind of open up again, uh, becoming a supple leopard uh, from Kelly Sturette has a lot of great information in there. A, a 10 minute squat's probably going to be too long for you to do when your knees aren't healthy, but occasionally just getting yourself down into a good squat position um, kind of going off of this uh, pain level of nothing should hurt more than like a three out of 10. So you do want to promote blood flow. You do want to get a lot of movement. You do want to do a lot of exercising um, to help strengthen all the muscles, ligaments, tendons around that area. But you, there's also really no good reason to go beyond a pain level really of like one or two, honestly. But mm -hmm. you can use that marker of like three out of 10 because once it starts to get to be that painful, then it is now a, uh, in my opinion, like a negative input into your system. And you want to, you want to have it be a positive input. And so get yourself down into a squat position whenever you can. And you may find that you might need support in doing that. So you may have to attach a band to a rack and, and hold, you know, put your hands on, on the uh, bands uh, to be able to allow you to get down into that position. Some other ways that you can get your knee to bend in a similar way is just to be on the ground and to um, basically sort of like sit on your knees. Now, that might be painful, but you sit on your knees whatever way you can. And maybe like the hard ground, maybe that sucks. Maybe that hurts way too much because it hurts the kind of the front of your knees. You just try to sit on something, um, you know, get down on the ground on something that's more padded and uh, try to lean back and... and and work on some of that. I think obviously like we talk a ton about myofascial release. Mm -hmm. I can't talk about it enough because <laughs> it just is like the number one cause of everyone being fucked up. I mean, even when I see people just walking on the street, I like want to have them like, I want to just hand them like a lacrosse ball and be like, yo man, <laughs> let me, let me just show you this one thing. You got to like rub the side of your shin on this fucking thing for a minute. It's going to change. It's going to change your life. It's going to change. Smash out your glute real quick. Yeah. I yeah, <laughs> know that's going to help. Yeah. Back, it's just going to be with my elbow yeah. or my chin, <laughs> but it really can be really helpful. It really can make uh, that big of a difference for some people. So mm. you might have to get into some of the stuff like in the back of the knees, which can be really painful, but um, sled drags, trying to build up some of those muscles. Um, she mentioned having like a lot of pain, like the Days day after. after. Yeah. Yeah. And that sucks. And you're really just developing like a lot of, uh, stiffness. And so when I think of that sort of thing, I think of that sort of scenario, I just think the only thing we're left with is you just have to move a lot mm -hmm. to figure out a way to move a lot. So when I get done with a run, a lot of times there's two things that are like the last two things that I want to do. Number one is like bend straight over, like uh, fold at the hips, uh, hip hinge. Mm -hmm. Cause like just the hammies and the glutes and like everything's just, I was upright for an hour running mm -hmm. and my body's just so tight. I don't want to do that. The other thing I don't want to do is do a squat. <laughs> and those are, those are both things that I do after every single run. I do them right away. They, they literally, I mean, it, it feels like my knee is going to tear. Oh. It feels like it's going to snap. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt, but it's so stiff that I'm like, oh my God, like, am I going to be able to do this? Mm. I do three reps and that's gone. Yeah. Completely gone. Mm. Completely gone. I, I like a lot of times I'll hang on to like a park bench or something and I'll squat down and I, you know, it takes me a minute. I might have to do like little mini reps and then I can start doing like a full rep and then I kind of sit there and then I kind of kind of breathe through it. But once I do like three reps, then my body feels amazing. And also, I've noticed that when I don't do that, that my body will cramp up, I'll tighten up, I get in the car, I go to get out of the car, and I'm just so stiff, I'm pushing off of everything possible, I'm leaning on everything, mm -hmm. as I'm trying to even like just walk through my house, my feet hurt, 
that one little extra bit of movement is really, really helpful. So trying to be mindful of just how you're moving throughout the day. You may have to figure out a lot of different ways of just bending your knees a ton. Um, a leg curl, actually. Pulling a sled forward and doing a leg curl are the two easiest things. And also like a stiff leg deadlift. Those are all movements that can help your that can help your quads a ton via or not help your quads, help your knees a lot via helping with stabilization because you're working the hamstring. Those are all like very manageable things. Um, a seated banded leg curl is super easy. You can look it up on YouTube. Um, that all those things would be great places for you to start. Yeah. And, and one thing, just don't, don't get discouraged because like when you have an area that is an issue, you tend to like focus in on doing everything for that area. Mm -hmm. And like you just mentioned, Mark, working around the area, hamstrings, glutes, tibs, right? This is something that like, that's all in that zero program, but working all around and, and, improving the way the system works will massively improve the way that specific area works right so just just keep keep that in mind it's going to take a little bit but if you're able to do something that has a holistic approach to your knee in a year again you're, you'll be in a very different position so agreed all right well jose vega wants to know what are your thoughts on the benefits of kratom for running i've noticed it helps but i don't quite understand why mm -hmm. Kratom for running can help help you end up like running forever sometimes. <laughs> uh, I like it a lot uh, for a run. Um, I uh, I go through different time periods when I u utilize Kratom uh, for a run and when I don't. I've found that it's really smart and really important that you you do stuff without the intervention of other things. You know, you kind of hear this all the time from people that are really big into coffee. Like, don't even talk to me before I have my cup of coffee. <laughs> and uh, it kind of sets them up for the day. I think with Kratom, I think you can get yourself into a position of taking way too much of it. Um, and you can get yourself in a position where you take the Kratom and then you go run. And I think what you should do is you should run. And if your run is maybe miserable, then maybe you spice it up a little bit with Kratom. But that, that's kind of the way that I handle it. But, yeah, I use it. Um, I know Zach Bitter and a bunch of other guys uh, like to utilize it for a run. Okay. All right. Cool. How many more questions do you guys want to take? Three more. Three more? All right, cool. So, Alex Reister. Are there specific mindfulness techniques or practices that you guys practice to enhance your mental well-being in conjunction with your physical training? It's mm. a great question. Yeah, I think there's all kinds of stuff uh, that I do throughout a day, but I honestly, I do not, and it's something I need to work on, I do not give myself enough time for that kind of thing. I just tend to, like, Jump there's, not. yeah, there's just, like, a lot of stuff to do in a day, and that one just always falls to the bottom of the barrel. I used to spend a ton of time doing that stuff, and that is what created, like, everything that you see here today, um, because I would just... I would spend time just thinking. I don't really spend as much time thinking in that way. Um, I do, you know, run. I will meditate. Uh, but when I'm meditating, I don't think of anything. And when I'm running, um, I mean, I could be thinking of like a number of things, but it's not really like a good mindfulness practice necessarily. So it is something I do need to get back to. I have been practicing a little bit of journaling lately. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is something that I need to. So this is a good reminder. I need to kind of get back to messing with more of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I used to journal a lot. Like I filled up different journals, and it's been good to look back on now that I'm like 31 to see what the fuck my 21 year old mind was thinking. Um, but that's been helpful, and that's something I started doing again. And I think it's great because like there's a lot of things that like will go through my head during a day, and I'll forget it. Like I'll like uh, I'll have a certain moment where I think about something where I'm like, oh fuck, fuck, and, and then when I journal, I'm able to reflect mm. on these things. Like I remember certain aspects, like oh shit, yeah, that's important, that's important. I'm grateful for this, etc. So I think that's extremely good. Um, I've been trying to find more time to kind of be silent. Uh, so like you know, in the morning, rather than taking a walk and having music going or listening to a podcast, I'll just walk without anything so that my mind has time to think. Because when there's music on, at least for me personally, like, you know, you're, you're, you're going to that music, but you don't really have much time with yourself. And I found that like over time, 
I, I am, I think like many people, I am addicted to noise. Either there's music going or there's something I'm listening to that I'm learning or there, there's, there's just no time where I can just listen to nothing. And I think that's something that's been super beneficial, like extremely beneficial for me. Um, the cold plunge is great. Fucking love it. Uh, gets you in a good mood. Not everyone can get a cold plunge, so cold shower. And this app, Opal, because I know some of us, like I find myself when I open up my phone, I'll just default to my, even without thinking, my finger will want to go to Instagram and open it up. And Opal is an app that I use just to block things mm. so that what ends up happening is I'll pick up my phone and I'll start to go, I'll click it and it's blocked. I'm like, wait, why the fuck am I clicking it to, to, to use this shit? I, need anything on fucking Instagram right now. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll, I'll like, it, it gets you like thinking about the actions you're taking. Cause you don't click it because there's other people around and God forbid they say anything to you. Oh, oh like, I have to talk to somebody. That video Whoa. that you sent me, like, like <laughs> you, you're good. like in line at Starbucks and you see somebody and you're like, <laughs> yeah, make sure you have the headphones in. So you're yeah. signaling to everybody that you cannot speak to them. Have closed off body language. So no one approaches you and tries to say hello. Yeah. Just, <laughs> screw that. So yeah. How about you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I think about how, like, I have a family of four and I'm the sole provider. And if I get sick, if I get hurt, or if I don't complete all my tasks 100%, they're probably going to, you know, die of starvation. That's what I do to help my mental health. Just <laughs> completely joking. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah, I, I although at one point I, I used to think that, like, there was so much, like, writing on me. And it's, you know, it's whatever. Eventually you figure it out. But what I do recently, like now is like, I just, uh, I started uh, picking up reading like every single day, like no nice. matter what. Yeah. Even if it's, you know, has nothing to do with like personal development or whatever it is. And I'm not talking about like on my phone. Oh, let me see what articles I could read. Cause that gets out of control really fast. <laughs> but no, I get my Kindle and I, I leave my phone, you know, pretty far away from me. It's there just in case. But like, I, you know, I, I used to read a little bit and then grab my phone in the morning and then I would read a little bit more and then grab my phone a little bit less. And then now it's kind of altered to where I don't actually pick up my phone like the entire morning until I'm like kind of like moving, you know, before it would be like the first thing I picked up and I would, you know, scroll all the social medias, right? Kind of like uh, you have your flow, you go like, oh, let me check out Instagram and check out my email, check out Twitter, check out, you know, you, you're like, oh, I forgot to check this site or whatever it is. And, and once I stopped that, it was pretty cool because like I started getting ready quicker. Like, you know, I started eating on time and I started getting here a little bit earlier. And so like it had a really cool cascade of effects and all these things that it affect that it impacted, like impacted my mental health because I was no longer rushing. Mm. I was no longer starting the mornings with like, oh my gosh, you know, this conflict or whatever, even though I don't have an opinion on it. I don't have any like stake in the game or anything, but it's like, wow, these people are really angry at, you know, X, Y, and Z. Like, that's interesting. It's like, it definitely takes a toll on me. And so when I started reading, it was just like, ooh, we're like nice, cool, calm, like let's start the day and, you know, on, on the right foot. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I've been doing. Yeah, there's two things that I do a decent job of. And one is uh, I try to look at my schedule for like the next day or even the day after and start to think about my week and what the week's going to look like. Since I don't have a real job, I get to kind of like sub things in at different times. And, um, and then the sec so I do that often that helps just organize my day, helps organize my thoughts, organizes the way that I eat, it just organizes everything. So that is really helpful. Um, I've talked about it a million times before, but like when I get home from here, it sometimes is at like around four o'clock or so. And the first thing that I do is I take a shower, I change, and I will put clothes out for the next day. Sometimes it's not everything, but it's like most of my shit that I need for the next day. And so that a practice like that has really been helpful to me in terms of being mindful, but it also sort of helps with like mental health because then it's it's just less to worry about. Mm -hmm. It's like it already got done. It got done... Um, almost, it feels like it, it happened almost effortlessly rather than like me trying to find like what I need in the morning, sometimes with the lights off, if my wife is still sleeping or whatever, it's just more complicated for me to do it at a different time. So I try to take care of it at that time. And that has always helped me like get the next day started easier because I've already showered and did a bunch of shit that otherwise might take up time in a given day. 
And the other thing is, I think when we're thinking about mindfulness, maybe we're just thinking about like ourselves, but my favorite thing to do is try to think about other people and try to think about like, what's it like for this person? What, what are they, what are they doing? What are they building? What are they going for? What are their goals? You know, and I try to think about the people around me and the people that I care about. And I try to, maybe there's a uh, friction, maybe there's something to resolve. Maybe there's just communication. Like I just need to communicate with somebody. So I might just simply just send them a text or something, but, um, I do a pretty good job of that. And that's something that I've been conscious of for maybe like the last four or five years or so. And that, that's just, I mean, it's, it's a cheat code into taking better care of yourself is just thinking about other people. She, oh, yeah, that's important. That's very important. Okay, cool. Now, uh, Mm. All right. <laughs> I'm just like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Why was this viewed 480,000 times? <laughs> <laughs> There's just so many questions. I, okay. Oh, uh, okay. You know what? Uh, Yeet Jones, thought on cable exercises. I've seen this movement of people using cables to replace big movements like deadlifts, RDLs, or incline bench. Curious what y'all thoughts on it. I know Andrew has a lot of thoughts on it. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I, so I am the smallest guy in the room, but I used to be extremely smaller than what I am right now. But I, I do all my movements on a cable machine. Um, I think they are – you can target muscles better. Um, I feel a, a much better pump when I'm working out with cables, um, safer. Uh, and, and with a, a dual cable machine, you can hit every single muscle group. Um, some of them are very obvious. Some of them you got to get a little creative, but yeah, I, I love cable, uh, cable movements and I'll be doing those for the rest of my life. Cables and machines and all this stuff. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to, to strength training. Mm -hmm. I mean, the barbells are, they're like kind of fun. They can be fun in a way, but it does take, again, it takes a lot of learning. It takes some warming up. It just, you know, you walk into a gym and you're going to like squat or deadlift, you know, it. If you start getting proficient at those movements, it takes you a while to warm up and to get ready. Mm -hmm. I love the efficiency and the accuracy and how easily you can modify the intensity of cable work. Um, and even some of the machines to some extent. Um, but like, you know, one of those cable pieces that has some form of like a seated row, a lat pull down. Um, maybe mm -hmm. you have an area where you could do like cable crossover and... I mean, this idea that you can't get big unless you have, like, dumbbells and, and barbells, I think, is probably kind of ridiculous. I think that it's just, it's just why would you, you know, why, why would you only use cables? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of the question I would have sometimes. It's like, we have access to other stuff. Why not use other stuff? Even if you don't like the other stuff, it's like occasionally can you grab a kettlebell and do something with it? Mm -hmm. You know, occasionally can you... Uh, do some movements uh, that are a little different. I, I also do like the idea of all the stuff that we know about fitness comes from like the gym. And it's kind of unfortunate because there's so much more to fitness. There's so much more to the culture of exercise than just the gym. Like we don't really even need the gym necessarily. So the cables are cool. All this stuff's cool. But it's like, man, do a bunch of push-ups. Do a bunch of burpees. Do a bunch of regular body weight squats. Uh, do a bunch of lunges. You got Corey Gregory talking about doing a you know, 400-meter lunge or a mile lunge. It's like, man, that's, that's some crazy – why does no one else do that? Like everyone has it's the ability. Hard. It's, it's a lot of lunges. <laughs> that's what it is, right? It's too hard. And, it, you know, people um, – it's interesting because when I hear people talk about like keto or I hear people talk about intermittent fasting versus a bodybuilding diet and stuff, it's like, well, all that stuff, of course, you, of course you're going to like that. Of course you're going to like cutting out a, a macronutrient completely because it's easier. Mm. It's easier than being on a bodybuilding diet. The, how meticulous you have to be being on a bodybuilding diet and how regimented you have to do with your meals and everything is insane. So I think the idea like – the reason why cables are so awesome is because it kind of lends itself to you getting to exactly what you're looking for, which is get some sort of mechanical tension, get some sort of tension on the muscles. It allows you to get to that right away. Whereas with a even just a regular uh, dumbbell bicep curl, 
if you're not proficient and you you're not really you haven't been lifting for that long and stuff like that that takes a little while to get in there and to squeeze out the muscle and to really feel it uh but as my brother once said there's <laughs> if life could only be like a tricep push down if you do tricep <laughs> push downs for like 50 reps with with a certain weight it's so simple. You're going to feel that shit. You're going to be like, man, the back of my arms are burning. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I like that you, you mentioned like burpees, pushups, and even lunges because you're moving your body in different, different ways. Because with, um, with free weights, there's only one direction that the resistance is going and it's straight down. So with a cable machine, that resistance can come from almost any angle. Mm. And so like when you're even talking about a, a bicep curl, like when, when you're, when the, the dumbbell is straight down next to you. There's no resistance. But then as you come up, then you start to feel it. With a cable machine, that shit can start right away, mm -hmm. you know? Or, and you can alter it to where it's, like, at the very end, in the middle, or, you know what I mean? So, like, it can come from all over the place. So even with the the different types of exercises for the body, different bodies parts, you can also alter those many different ways also with the exact same machine. Mm. There we yeah. go. All right, two more quick questions. I want to answer this one real quick because, and we can all chime in even though, well, you'll see why. Uh, and Seema, as a natural athlete, do you take any full rest days? I find it hard to get out of my routine and skip the gym. Mm. Also, rest days are boring, and I'll find myself <laughs> looking in the fridge every 10 minutes. Damn. Um, That's life. Yeah, bro. So the thing I is, is that. yeah, you know, on certain days, I think we, we can all relate to waking up and not feeling that we have everything 100%. We don't want to, like, have a crazy hard workout. So to answer your question... I, I, th there aren't any days where I don't do nothing. Like I'll still jump rope. I'll still move. I'll still take a good walk. Um, I might do something very, very light on the assault bike for blood flow. But you know, if I don't feel that I have like, uh, I'm not going to be able to have a good session of jujitsu and I need to not go today, I won't go to jujitsu, but I'll still do something during the day. That's going to aid my recovery, whether it's taking a nice long walk, a nice long walk like an hour walk is going to help me recover mm -hmm. because I'm getting blood flow everywhere. My whole body's moving. I'll get done with that walk and everything will feel much better, but I'm never just, just doing nothing. I'm never just sitting at home and not doing anything for the whole day. So if you do have a day and the thing is, is you, if you feel like you need to take a day off of the gym, okay, take a day off the gym. You could go in and you could just get a small pump. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. a crazy workout, but take that day off, but make sure to get a walk in, do something that's going to allow you to get blood flow, get outside. Um, and that's much better than just not doing anything. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Yeah. Schedule something, yeah. you know, um, if it's a day like out of the gym, you know, I know like when I used to be really excited to go to the gym and like go to like a commercial gym, uh, long ass time ago that, I basically just would go to the gym every day and I would like, you know, maybe do calves and do like, you know, odd body parts that maybe I didn't get to uh, for the rest of the week. So that was always one way of handling that. But nowadays I just try to schedule stuff. So I'll go on walks, I'll go on a run, I'll do, I'll do something different rather than just having off. And also there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with having a day where you are kind of lounging around, where you are eating more. It actually might be really beneficial to you sometimes True. to have a day that's a little bit more lax. There's a little bit less things on the schedule. And um, I think if you can learn to make good food choices, I think you can look in the fridge almost as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Keep yourself active. Keep yourself moving. Because I, I find myself on certain days doing the same thing, but I have the conversation in my brain of like, this is totally fine. Like it's not a, this is not a problem. This is not a big deal. Like you want extra food for a reason. Like, okay, yeah, you're probably, you probably are kind of bored. You probably don't need the extra food necessarily, but your body, you know, you're doing quite a bit of work day in and day out, week in and week out. And maybe this is a good day to have a little bit of like reprieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's active recovery, but also like the saying originally was like rest and recovery. Mm -hmm. And just from what I learned from you guys about like me, like, no, I got to go every day to jujitsu. And it's like, hey, pull that back. And my jujitsu got better. So, yeah, I would just say you're not going to, you know, lose anything. But also like the, uh, what he was saying about like going into the fridge and stuff. I was like, ooh, I feel that. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's tough. <laughs> All right. Last question. And then we'll give some shit away. And then we shut this bitch off. Just remember, guys, when we, whoever the winners are, Please join the Discord. The link is in the description. Um, 
add me, Tren Sima, on Discord, and then send me your email address and your physical address and your name. Because if something's getting shipped to you, they're going to need your name. Okay? Mm. All right. Last question from Joe Seiler. What would you guys recommend for someone trying to become a hybrid athlete? I want to start running and lifting. Where should I start? Thanks, guys. Love the show. Okay. Let me get this real quick. Man, he's just starting out, huh? That's cool. Uh, I always think that the best place to start with running is to start by just getting out for some walks mm -hmm. and occasionally, um, you know, turning that walk into periodically jogging here and there. I don't think there's a lot of re lot of great reasons to go out and like try to run a mile and totally demolish yourself. I know that that uh, information probably gets discarded all the time. And then, you know, three weeks down the road, someone ends up with an injury and they're like, I don't understand what happened to my foot. Um, be cautious. Start out slow. There's no rush. Running is going to take some time. So I would say get yourself into a schedule of running every other day and get yourself into a schedule of lifting on those other days. Do your best to not um, lift and run uh, together um, in back-to-back -back days. So like, for example, like it's, it's Monday and you run and you lift and it's now Tuesday and you run and you lift. Try to avoid that as much as you can. You can run and lift on the same day, but try not to have it be back-to-back -back days. I just found for myself that from a recovery standpoint, it just it just makes everything more complicated. So just why do it? Um, but yeah, that would be my advice is to run three days a week, lift three days a week, and uh, to start low and slow. Take, take it easy. All right. All right, guys. So... Whoever ends up winning the gift cards from Good Life Proteins, give that about a week and a half um, because our guy from Good Life can sometimes take a little bit slow. But two of you guys are going to win $150 gift cards to Good Life Proteins, meaning you're going to be able to get yourself some meat. They have Wagyu, salmon, chicken, mm. duck, steak. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of good stuff. And we've well, been streaming for two and a half hours. Yeah, this has gone on for a while. Hell yeah. All right, I'm Mark, trying to, I'm trying to get your pecs. Mm. Got to be careful. <clears throat> Okay, let's get ready. First name, winning a gift card from Vivo Barefoot. Now, nah, you're going to win a pair of free shoes, whatever one pair of free shoes. Who is this? Don Sornberger. You're going to win a pair of Vivo Barefoot shoes. Make sure to join the Discord, mm. message me in there, and I will get you that code so you can get yourself some free kicks. Next person is going to win a gift card from Good Life Proteins. We have Ben Bor. Oh, is this Ken Borges? Mm -hmm. Shit, I can't tell if my it's a uh -oh. K or a B. I think it's Ken Borges. So Ken Borges, you win a gift card to Good Life Proteins. What if there's a Ben Gorgeous in the live stream? That'd be highly unfortunate. <laughs> or a gorgeous for Ken. <laughs> yeah, that'd be highly unfortunate. <laughs> All right, this next person is going to win a year's supply of hostage tape. Gunpowder? No, it's not. I um, was like, no way. <laughs> Scott Levesque, you're going to win a year's supply of hostage tape. Member, join the Discord. <laughs> message me. You guys ready? Discord is in the... Go ahead. Gunpowder tea. Oh, here we gun go. Gunpowder tea. Gunpowder gun tea. tea. <laughs> Come on, gunpowder. <laughs> gun See what we got? Gunpowder. Did you win that? Sh will that shit into existence? Gunpowder tea. Hey! Come this on. guy's won something on this the last rigged. three lives. <laughs> that fuck? guy's gotten more shit from our sponsors than me. Yo, can, <laughs> I don't, we can't zoom in on this because I don't want people to think we're picking this man's name. But the last three right times, here. huh? This camera right here. I, don't, I can't. Like he's he's won three times. Three times you win a fucking gift card to Good Life Proteins. Fuck, he's already, got, this guy already probably has a lot of luck in, just in his life yeah. in general. You know, he did message me something. He's like, he's like, for some reason, I do well with things like this. That's what he said. Wow, he's <laughs> so, probably he's probably in one of those bubbles where he's talking to people and he's like, oh, you know, I want another show. Like, like you know what it's like. And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, you mean you don't ever win all the time? He's like, no, I don't. Yeah, almost like, anybody that's that so strange ever wins anything. They're always like, I don't ever win any of these competitions. And he's like, weird. <laughs> this is one of those people that should probably maybe try buying a lottery ticket once a week. <laughs> just, <laughs> just me. He's like, just actually, once period. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, seriously. He just goes in there and once. And he's like, actually, that's why I'm here because I won the lottery and I don't have anything to do. So I just listen oh, to you guys. Oh, God. 
All right, last Fuck. person. You're going to win a gift card to Within You Supplements for $75. This is Yeet Jones. Yeet Jones. Good job, Yeet. So, member, join the Discord. Almost 3,000 strong in the Discord. Message and, uh, you know, cool. Yeah. You know, message me and we'll get your stuff out to you. Also, for everyone that's here, um, it does help the podcast. I don't know if you guys listen on Apple or Spotify because I know you're on YouTube right now, but if you go leave us a review, that helps the podcast grow on the audio side and that will be beneficial. So, we appreciate you all. Speaking of the audio side, Andrew, you're working on some sort of class or something, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the background. That's going to be cool. Are we allowed to talk about that at all? Um, we can. It just It's like I said, it's it's in the process, mm -hmm. but it's just one of those things where you start and like even just so like I'm going to have like a, a gear list for people. For and people that are looking to maybe try to start a podcast cold from not yeah. knowing anything. Yeah, yeah. For like under 300 bucks, you can be podcasting what? like with high quality what sound. What the fuck? I got, video. <laughs> I got so, screwed. I know you did a little bit. But 300 bucks? Yeah. So the, the <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to look like oh, this. Oh, okay, okay. I understand. It'll look in their own special way. But even with that, I'm like, okay, yeah, let me just like, I'll, I'll give people like a, a quick, easy, free, like one, two page PDF download. And I start writing and I'm mm. going and I'm going. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm 10 pages deep. Like this is too much. Now I have to pull back from it. But what I'm getting at is like every step of the way, I'm like, oh, it's, this is like five bullet points or whatever. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, I haven't thought about X, Y, and Z. So it's going to be a very thorough, in-depth uh, mm. course on starting your podcast. And I'm going to start filming hopefully this weekend for it. And we'll see how quickly I can get it done. But yeah, I want, it, I want to launch it in February. Um, so up until that point, though, I'll be starting to do some like promotion and stuff like that. Freaking cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank strength you. Strength is never weak. This week is never strength. Catch you guys later. And Bye. real quick, oh. you'll have to do that one more time. For everybody here, remember, it's probably, we're going to be doing this every Thursday at 11. There you go. So if, if you didn't know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific, we'll probably be doing a live. So just understand that, and we'll see you all next week. We're here. Right. Gunpowder T is here. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> strength is never weak. This week is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode, which I know you did because you got this far, then click this one right here because you'll enjoy this one just as much. And if you're choosing to still listen to me currently, as I'm telling you to go over here and watch this video, well, hey, that just means you like the sound of my voice. <laughs> and well, I'll just keep seducing you right here. Hello. <laughs>